I'd like to open a public hearing on the for the purpose of receiving public comment for the sale of certain real estate, which is Five Hill Court. Is there anyone who would like to testify at this public hearing? I don't see anyone who would like to testify, so I will close the hearing. Okay, the next meeting is the Urbana City Council meeting, and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? Here. Mr. Brown? Here. Mr. Jacobson? Here. Mr. Madigan? Here. Go Cardinals. Ms. Marlin? <laughs> Here. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Here. Mayor Pressing? Here. First item is the approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. <laughs> we have two, August 17th and August 31st, which was a special meeting. Move approval. And I'll second. Motion by Marlin, seconded by Roberts. Any additions or corrections to either one of those sets of minutes? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Are there any additions to the agenda? Diane. I have a possible deletion. Um, item C, under Committee of the Whole, we uh, delayed consideration of the um, transportation company, transportation network company services to later this month. Okay, that's right. Good call. Yes, Mike. Uh, there was a request uh, from uh, Joe Hooker. Either he or another attorney may show up. Uh, they're at the county board right now, and they're going to try and be here by like about eight fifteen. If we could delay consideration of. Uh, Resolution number um, 215.08-047R until they get here would be appreciated. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Is that okay with the with the committee or with the council rather? Okay. We'll move on to petitions and communications. Steve Carter, would you like to speak now? You want to do it later? Okay. All right, uh, Mother Mary Brooks. Good evening. Good evening. Um, here in regards to the rezoning for um, the halfway house, I guess that's what it's called, on Matthews. And I just like to state my opposing. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the police, the men's in blue for all of the things that they done when we had little Beirut on Beslin and the north side of Urbana. Um, they did their job. They really did their job. And there was a, I want to publicly thank them because there was a lot of abuse heaped up on the police that they shouldn't have had to face. And I realize it's because the training that they had, they were able to handle certain situations. I've seen more guns and faced more guns in the last six months than I have when I was in, on the farm shooting rabbits. Mm -hmm. And um, if you have to live like that, it's not a good thing. Uh, we can sit back and speculate about how it feels. But when bullets are sailing 
by your head, you, you don't know what you're going to think and don't know what you're going to do. So I want to thank them. Because I was a victim. I was a victim because they shot in my home. And I'm the one who had to pay the bill and didn't cause any problems. I've seen things that I've never seen in my 78 years. The disrespect, the name calling, the profanity. So I have to say they have great, great training. They have the type of training that some of the people in our community need. And I don't know why we're not giving it to them. We're giving them everything else. I oppose to the rezoning of zoning from, set, from R2 to R4, medium density, family residential district. 50 years ago, I moved to this community. It was a single family home where I raised my children, my husband and I. It was good enough for us then, and it's good enough for us now. We moved there when blacks could not move anywhere, but, and I'm not making this a black thing, I'm just giving you the history. Between University, Bradley, Wright Street, and Matthews was the only place we could go. You went on the other side of Ellis, and the Ellis did, uh, was the only cornfields. So um, we was not even able to look in our home. We bought it without looking inside of it. And this is America. But we took it, and we did what we could with it. And you, you have one minute. OK, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. Okay. Anyway, I want to say, I have more than a minute, but I'm going to say, I'm going I'm to be obedient. We pay tax. I'll move for more time. Yeah, second. Yeah, I, I agree with that. We paid our tax on time. We supported Urbana. I am not against women's. I'm a woman myself. I raise nine children. I worked every day. I'm not against any woman, but I am tell you this. As a person who worked in community outreach for 39 years, in every facet that you can think about, you cannot re rehabilitate anyone unless they want to be a re rehabilitate themselves. So we can give them everything. I would have loved to have one of the new houses, but I wasn't able to have one. So I made mine new. Um, this, in, in reality, this area should be a historical community because of the longevity that we have had in this community. And, and we had business uh, uh, laundry that was built up by the Sheltons. Um, and we had hollows. But we never got anything that the other communities got. We didn't get a, a senior home. Instead of getting a senior home when Donbar Court was towed down, we got that home, that, those houses down there uh, on the corner of Eads and, and Wright Street that causes all of, a lot of problems, a lot of problems. You can't even walk down there. I feel bad for my grandchildren going to Washington School over in Champaign because they shoot over there. Um, we need to rehab, rehabilitate from university to um, Bradley rather than try to put something else new in. Because we're dealing with uh, working with people who don't have things. One of the things I'm going to say, and I'm going to get on, we all make choices. And for every negative behavior, 
there is accountability for it. And everybody needs to learn that. Everyone needs to learn that. Per political correctness is on its way out in America because it has killed us. Because in, in reality, what we did was we left behind right and wrong. And right and wrong shall always be in, no matter what anybody say. We need to teach that to our children. And so they won't be doing the things that they're doing now. They need to learn respect. And it's going to have to come from the people in the community as well. The police can't teach them no respect because they hate the police. Most of them do. I'm just going to tell you straight out. There's no great respect just because I like them, you know. I like the uniform. I was taught that you respect that uniform. I may not like him. I may even tell him I don't like him. But I am going to respect that uniform because I value the laws in the United States of America. We can't continue to be corrupting what we have. It's time for us to build. We, I already said that. So we must get back to our ethics. Where is the ethics at? I'd like to see a little ethics in people. We had enough of picking up behind others who, who say, who make excuses. We are a whole country of making excuses. In Urbana, we make too many excuses for bad behavior. There's no way that we should be making bad, be, uh, picking up behind them when they make their choices. And I read the bio that they had. It says, what would Jesus do? They asked in that bio, and I'm not trying to preach to you, but I'm just going to say one thing for sure. They said, if they steal, uh, if they lie, that they will go on and do whatever they have to do. But I'm going to tell you what Jesus said. Thou shalt not steal, I read, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie, and you supposed to obey the laws of the land. So I'm going to say, the landlords need to be held, and all of this is involved, be held responsible for what they do in the north side of, of, of Urbana. If you notice, I'm not saying the north end like people say, because I learned a long time ago. It's the north side of town. You don't say the dead end of the south side. You don't say the dead end of the east side. But when you get to the northwest side, people call it the, the north end. No, it's the north side of town. And as aldermans, you all are going to have to deal with it one way or another. I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to say, should the disadvantage be, the disadvantage should not be placed on the back of the poor. And we are a poor area, the hardworking people. We got some people we would like to get rid of. You can have them over on your side of town. Um, but last but not least, I'd like to say that there was something that offended me greatly here when the man said that he bought a house that was uh, irrepute. I won't say what he said. House of irrepute. And he did it to save us. Well, I got news for you. We're not prostitutes. And he haven't saved us from anything. And I am very, I'm not upset with you, because you don't know what people are going to say when they get up here. But I am upset with him. He had no right. We, whatever you say about one African American, usually we all have to live about it. And I know I'm a lady. I've been over there 50 something years, and I've never seen a house of year of repute. I've seen other things over there, but I haven't seen that. So I don't know where he learned it from. He, maybe he was there. I don't know. But anyway, uh, <coughs> John Kennedy said, think not what your country can do for you, but think what you can do for your country. 
And I have lived by that ever since John Kennedy ran and won. And I taught my children that. Think what you can do for others. You gonna get a job. If you are not going to school, you gonna get a job. I, I could have been out and been in a woman's place, but I said I wasn't. I screwed up floors the state way. I went to college, I got my degree, I raised my children, I put them through school. Martin Luther King said, nonviolence is the way. And I believe that. And I shall always believe it. If they want to shoot and fight, the police can't do anything but arrest them and take them to court and they, and they be back home before I can get my night clothes on to go to bed. But, uh, and that's what happens. The police can't do anything but arrest them and do their job. Somehow we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do. If you just pat them on the shoulder and pat them on the hand, they're never going to do any better. But they, they need to learn that they have responsibilities to build for themselves. I build my life, and I want to keep it like it is. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Spencer. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, it's on the consent decree. And as you know, this is being debated before 14 different public bodies. This has been going on for uh, quite a while, so you guys aren't present for all the debates and all the things that have been going on, so I kind of want to bring you up to speed of where we're at today. One of the problems is, is the Muhammad Aquifer sole source designation is being misrepresented. We've found out that the uh, Illinois regulations that are in place will not allow a landfill to be permitted above the Muhammad Aquifer under any circumstances. So currently saying that a siting may go back to DeWitt County, it's a 100 percent impossibility. It cannot go back to them. In the federal uh, petition for the Muhammad Aquifer, there was a responsive summary given by the federal government that identifies what the Muhammad Aquifer is. I'd like to read it to you. It says, reviewed by the EPA shows that the inconsistencies between the aquifer zones and the Glassford formation and the Muhammad Aquifer are highly variable and localized. The three-dimensional modeling performed by the Illinois State Geological Survey supports the existence of these interconnections. According to the Illinois State Geological Survey, the Glassford Formation in particular contains discontinuous deposits of sand and gravel forming an aquifer zone. Even though the Illinois State Geological Survey understand, understanding of these interconnections is evolving and this evolution may not have been fully captured in the groundwater flow model presented in road cap at 211, the EPA believes that it is appropriate to designate the Muhammad Aquifer system, including the overlying aquifer zones, such as those in the Glassford Formation, as an SSA. Joe Hooker today at the Water Authority meeting referred to a state law that's in place. It says no part of a unit may be located within the recharge zone or within 366 meters, 1,200 feet, vertically or horizontally of a sole source aquifer designated by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Unless there is a stratum between the bottom of the waste disposal unit and the top of the aquifer that meets the following requirements, and that's plural, and there's four of them, there has to be 50 feet. Currently, Clinton Landfill is inside of the aquifer itself. They may be grandfathered in for their municipal solid waste unit, but they can never, 
expand the facility or go back to the Illinois EPA or DeWitt County Board for a siting. It would be in violation of state law. DeWitt County is, or DeWitt, Clinton Landfill is well aware of this fact. This is the reason this consent decree is before you right now. The only chance that Clinton Landfill has to keep the chemical waste unit is to get you to do it. That is what's before you tonight. The other questions that came up at Savoy, since we're debating this thing by bouncing around from the 14 government bodies, their attorney is really upset over the concept that once you enter into a consent decree, if there's a problem we with this waste that you're allowing to be left inside of this landfill, you may actually be financially responsible to do the cleanup with Clinton Landfill. They've got themselves in a consent decree right now that they're fighting this fight. The other problem that the Water Authority had is this agreement will lead to more litigation. Do you, if you want to enforce this or do anything with it, you've got to go back to court again. All these cases will reach the same plateau that you're at right now. Clinton Landfill's business is law. They will go right in, they, they sue people, it's just a daily part of their business. Brian McGinnis shows right up at a meeting and says, I'm going to sue you. That's the first thing he says, because he knows that he's going to scare most people when he does it. And they carry it out. They sued the Sierra Club for them actually foying information. And they caused them to actually supply all the documents that they had in Peoria when they attempted to get the hazardous waste landfill there. The other question that's been coming up is this transfer station in Champaign. There's a question why money is going to be paid to Champaign from Clinton Landfill for all the waste in this region going to Champaign first before it goes to Clinton. This is something that Clinton Landfill does on a regular basis. They offer a little bit of money to somebody to support their landfill operation. Watch is in favor of of money, I'll guarantee you, because there's a lot of money here, but we want this money to support businesses that are willing to recycle. I don't want one single penny to go to a landfill that's going to continue polluting our water. This process has to come to an end. The rest of the country has already accepted it. Our laws are in place in the state of Illinois. We're ready for it. The other question I've got your, is your this. Time, your time expired okay. when the little buzzer went off. Okay. Thank you. Does some, did is there you any questions? Give him more time. Yeah, let's have three more minutes maximum. Okay. I would like to have, I would ask that we do this in the form of questions. Like okay. I have a, a few questions that may be answered. So instead of you going on for another three minutes and then having to ask questions, if that's okay. Yeah. All right. So. You mentioned siting. I don't know if everyone else understands. I certainly don't know what you mean by siting. And you talked about the sole source designation and, and sightings. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard testimony, I guess, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, that um, we need to sign this consent decree or support this consent decree because um, it would, if not, then the landfill could go back and ask for um, the ability they could resubmit this application that they pulled. Are you saying that the what you've just stated, the statute and what you read, says that they, they can't even apply for that? Um, I just want to make sure to make that clear to us. Yeah, let, let, let me kind of clarify what a siding is to begin okay. with. Uh, in the United States, the EPA uh, uh, has a structure to where the federal government controlled RECRA they actually gave that authority to states, okay? During that process, states actually have created some of their own laws that may not, they mirror or meet the requirements of federal law. They can be more restrictive, but they can't be less restrictive. Illinois has passed a law that requires a local siting. That means that this body right here, if somebody wanted to apply for a landfill within your jurisdiction, they would have to come and lay down a couple hundred thousand dollars and a form that would apply for you to consider, do all the engineering studies, have public hearings, go through a whole lengthy process, and then come to the conclusion whether or not you're going to pass it, you would vote on it then. That's a siding. Uh, other states, the governor may have it. 
State legislators have said the governor of the state may have it. So here in Illinois, we have local sightings. Uh, Dwick County is the one that's in charge of this sighting because it's in their jurisdiction. It's outside of the municipalities. It's in the county directly. So the, the question here is, can if the first step is you go to a sighting. Then once you get a sighting in place, then the applicant will go to the Illinois EPA and say, hey, I got a sighting, I'm approved, here's my application. This is a very confusing process for a lot of people that are not involved in EPA regulatory processes. The landfill creates the application. They actually write it themselves. They, they will take that application to the Illinois EPA and they'll review that, and if they don't like it, the Illinois EPA calls them up on the phone and says, paragraph four, line three, change this from it to that, you know. That is the process that's used. It refines that application. Once it's signed and that application's in process, the public is outside of the regulatory scheme. It is totally controlled by the agency 100%. So the only part that the public has any access to is the initial siting. What this law says is you can't even get a permit. So it would be a waste of time for Clinton Landfill to show up at a municipality or a county board meeting and say, hey, I want a siting, because they already know it. There, there's no question in their mind that they know that if the fourth appellate court rules that a siting was required, they cannot run back and get the siting. Watch okay, so was well aware of this when we did the sole source. So I'm just trying to make sure I understand. When you say siting, are you saying that a person has to or a group has to get a siting in order to get a landfill? Yes. Or, so, but there's already a landfill there. Yes. The municipal landfill is already there. And it was created before the sole source designation and the decision by the federal government that protects the Muhammad Aquifer. The so next it's grandfathered in, basically. It's grandfathered in. Okay. And so what occurred before 2007, it holds. I mean, I, we can sit here and we can cry about well, that's, it and well, that's do whatever why we want to do. And so I wanted to get to that uh -huh. particular point because my yep. second question was in relationship to cleanup. So what's mm -hmm. on the site right now? What, what, you, what you cited mm -hmm. as a sole source designation, yes. um, does it require cleanup? The process that we're in right now in court is a process that uh, challenges the fact that the chemical waste unit should have never been built and required a siting. The waste should have never been put in there. In June of 2011, we flew over it with an airplane and discovered that there was a chemical waste unit that was constructed and had waste in it. There was a federal meeting that was going to occur within a week, public meeting. The federal government just about blew a cork. They could not believe that somebody had actually built the landfill and put waste inside of it. That's what tripped all of this, was the fact that Clinton Landfill was saying they weren't going to construct this, not until they had federal approval. They went ahead and constructed and began taking waste into the facility without even a permit. So, so I mean, I understand some of that part mm -hmm. of it. I'm just trying to make sure as mm -hmm. from a... a if you know the answer to this, is that if you sole source designation, mm -hmm. the fact that it was uh, considered a sole source designation, does that um, require a cleanup in, an, in and of itself? The, it, the waste does not belong. I can't require it. Nobody can require it. You end up going into a courtroom and a judge has to order them to remove the waste from there. Okay. That, that's where this is at still right. as far Thank as enforcement. You. The Illinois EPA has actually filed that they violated the law. They're actually trying to negotiate to leave the facility and the waste both there is what this is for. And they're asking you to approve that agreement to leave the facility. Because if they don't get the facility, they can't come back and apply for it later on. It's over with once the sole source went into operation. Are there any other questions for Mr. Spencer? Mm -hmm. uh, Diane, can you state your background? And your expertise the, in this? The reason that I've, people, you know, I, I guess I've, I worked for Eastman Kodak and Sterling Drug. I was trained by the U.S. federal government as a uh, hazardous waste handler and uh, was deployed in special cleanups in the United States and stuff. So my background goes uh, quite a ways in for this type of stuff. Um, I supervised, I was in the upper management area as far as decisions made that would affect, I guess, the direction the United States was going to take in waste disposal. Okay, thank you. So, Eric? So, 
I'm inferring from what you said that you believe that if the consent decree, if we don't approve the consent decree, that the landfill will be forced to remove the, the waste that they put in there illegally, but if we do approve the consent decree, they will not be so forced. Yes. And, and by what mechanism, so, so there are two questions. By what mechanism do you believe that they will be forced to do that? And secondly, uh, what is there in the consent decree that prevents that from happening? Because that would be an action that would be taken by the government, not by us. It, it goes in reverse. It says in there that you guys are going to not require the waste to be removed. That's part of the agreement. That's the major. It says it right in the consent decree. Yeah, we won't require it, but but mm -hmm. but there's there there are other authorities what, that what, might require what, it. What correct? a judge will do is he's going to look at what you say because you're the elected official, and your word and your decision will carry the majority of weight in this before a judge. The first thing the Clinton landfill will do is pull out this consent decree, and they will say to the judge, "Your Honor, the Attorney General, the Illinois EPA, and 14 government bodies have said it's okay." To leave this waste here. Why should Mr. Spencer or anyone else, the public, have a right to challenge that? What we're trying to do is we're trying to have an opportunity to clean this up. It's not a lot. There's, there's two factors involved in here. Cleaning it up is not a big thing. I can go around and collect the money from people. We all show up with pickup trucks. We'll go get it done in 15 minutes. I mean, it's kind of a joke type of thing. The, even Joe Hooker says it's 1%. Of the, of the facility, I mean of this 22.5 acres. Mm -hmm. The next question then is, there's patriciple waste and there's chemical waste. Chemical waste means it won't produce water out of its own means. This is dry somewhat waste or been solidified and that type of waste is separate from municipal waste. The MGP waste, you know, my first thought is when I start thinking MGP waste, oh, that's just dirt. You know, it's just dirt. No, it's not dirt. If you took a shovel and scooped it up, it's coal tar mixed with sand, mm -hmm. and it's full of benzene and tooling and a bunch of other stuff. He's actually mixed this with uh, hydrated lime, which is extremely dangerous. The Illinois EPA says they're afraid of this thing igniting. It reached 4,000 degrees in temperature, hydrated lime well. Once you hydrate it, even if you get it wet and you dry it out and you play around with it, it's some very dangerous stuff to be messing with. This stuff is produced in a CCR, coal combustion mm -hmm. residue. It's ran through the scrubbers. This process is used to remove all the heavy metals and stuff that are actually going into the atmosphere that we are trying to stop. That's the reason why this stuff, the coal ash by itself, just the burn off stuff, the bottom ash, that ain't nothing like uh, you know this hydrated lime that's coming out of scrubbers. And he's collecting all that, millions of tons of it, and he's using it for solidification at this facility. We are having explosions that are shooting 1,000 feet into the air when they mix chemicals together that he's trying to solidify. Got pictures of it. He's trying to handle chemicals in a chemical waste unit. This is, this is an extremely dangerous process. You're mixing all these chemicals together and stuff. So what is the, uh, how, how are this, how is this particular category of waste uh, dealt with in other, other landfills the, in other parts the, of the, the country? Way industry, the way industry deals with this is there was a law passed in 1985-84 that basically said no hazardous waste can go into a landfill unless it's no longer hazardous. So we were required in industry to treat this waste. Mm -hmm. And they, we had a moratorium, a little window, to start complying with these regulations and preparing for this. Industry actually backed off in the United States producing these types of waste that are dangerous because the cost was going to go up higher and higher and higher. We've just got some people that are still hooked onto the old waste scheme that are wanting to find some place to dispose it at a cheap price. So, so we, so we somehow had some corporations nearby, I think, in the Chicago area, who shipped untreated uh, waste of this type to Clinton. 
Is that, is that, that what happened? What, what Clinton Landfill was targeting was there was a lot of money that was going to be used uh, for the cleanup in the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. Chicago's groundwater contamination is at 100 percent. You can't take a cup of water out of the ground in Chicago. There was a guy who just got, uh, I think he went to jail for it. He was a water guy that's supposed to be controlling the pumps and all the tests in the water plant. The water comes out of Lake Michigan. He was actually taking and going over pushing the start button on one of his old pumps and pumping water into the water tower because he was running short on his numbers. So to correct his numbers, that's what he was doing. That was... Mm -hmm. I mean, the people in Chicago about went through the ceiling over that. And he'd been doing this for years. So he'd been poisoning the people in Chicago for years, dumping that water in there. So, th I mean, it's a serious thing we're talking here, what you can contaminate with these types of chemicals. I think you have a question from Bill Brown. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, follow up on what you said, uh, the sole source aquifer designation that it would uh, prevent the Clinton landfill. Um, absolutely. And you, you mentioned the 50 feet and said that the Clinton landfill was already within the aquifer. So according to what I was reading, the, the stratum underneath the landfill has to be 50 feet of a certain conductivity with, with the, where water can't flow at a certain rate. And you're saying that doesn't exist? Yeah, yeah you, you would have to, um, you have to maintain all four of those categories. The 50 foot has to and that stratum does both. So what you would have to do is somehow float the landfill up and then put that 50 foot of that, can, that dense soil that can't have that transfer of hydraulics through it. So y that's impossible. So it, I thought the soil was already there. I, th I thought no, it was 150 what, feet above the No. See, and that aquifer. was what happened was is Clinton Landfill claimed in their federal application that there was 150 foot of clay under the landfill. <coughs> well, road cap was just like, blew his mind. Well, that's 150 foot of the Glassford Formation. <laughs> it's a white rock formation that's fractured. It's called Glacier Till. And 50% of the water that we actually pump out, for most people, we don't drill all the way down to the Muhammad Aquifer, the sand and river rock. We actually pump from the Glassford Formation. So the head of the Muhammad Aquifer is actually up in the Glassford. It's actually past the Glassford into the Illinois and Wisconsin glacier formations, which are real thin compared to it. They're like this, and the uh, Glassford formations like this, and then the Muhammad, I mean, it's still got another distance to it. So the US EPA is saying all of them. The only thing that's not part of the Glassford, or part of the Muhammad Aquifer sole source is the LUS on top, the, where we plant corn at and beans. Mm -hmm. A but very small, yeah. thin layer. Everything else is all part of it. Okay. It's the, actually the a recharge Glassford, area. The Glassford isn't continuous, so there's lenses here and there, and it's, there's spots where it's solid, and there's spots where the, it's the not. Way, so. The way I always kind of look at it, uh, and I, I do some drilling, but uh, RoadCap does it all the time. Um, if you go into a white rock quarry, and when I was a kid, I used to swim in them, you'd jump off the cliff, and then you'd be down in there, and the fish would come out and just bite you like crazy. There's all these fissures and cracks that are within the uh, Glassford formation, and all the fish go back into those cracks and come back out. Some areas have larger cracks, some have smaller cracks, and those are the ones that actually hold the volume of water. The other problem you run into, this stuff is not all consistent of that same glass or that uh, glacier formation. Some of it's sand and gravel that's mixed in with it. Clinton Landfill, when they did their initial uh, uh, geological survey of the site, they found those sand lenses that were close to 50 or 60 feet deep into the Glassford Formation. And the hydraulic test that they did show that you can pump water out of here and drop a well over here, you know, so fast. So there was connection between the two of them. So they had hydraulic conductivity. The other thing that's strange about this facility, he removed the Illinois and Wisconsin glacier formations totally. They're just wiped off the surface and he's dug down to the Glassford Formation right on top of it. So uh, any soil that is actually something that would protect it, it's all been removed. There's nothing there. You're sitting right on this Glassford. Okay, that, thanks. Okay. Okay, uh, Charlie? Yeah, some, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around. Mm -hmm. There are state, there's a state EPA regulations over mm -hmm. aquifers and then there's a federal Regulation. I'm looking at the state mm -hmm. exceptions here, uh, but you're, could you send me 
or email all of us the federal mm -hmm. EPA materials that you're referring yes. to, please. Yes, Thank I you. will. I will. Oh, oh um, Dennis. Well, it seems like this, we're, we're just taking public comment right now, mm -hmm. and this has become like a serious you know, issue with the public comment section, and I'm thinking that we're going to probably want to have this kind of conversation in more in depth when we have questions and answers during the regular conversation. So it's the likelihood of um, having this individual return for further discussion because we just are supposed to be listening to five minutes. I, I understand. I understand. I'm eating up your time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Apologize for being so long. Thank you. David Noreen. Yes, I, oh, those that are going around, that's a, uh, I actually emailed that to you uh, earlier today, but I thought you might want to have a copy sitting in front of you. What that is, is it's, it's the contents of the chemical waste unit at the Clinton landfill, uh, the dates that the things were deposited, who they came from, and how many tons. Um, I want to begin, though, by asking for an extension, because uh, once you pass this and approve this, I don't think you can rescind it, can you? It's, it's something that if you vote to uh, postpone it, you have a larger amount of time to consider things. And it's very important to the people uh, who are my friends at the Champaign County Healthcare Consumers because we've spent a lot of time, you know, thinking about having an educational effort for the public. And uh, if you proved it tonight, uh, you know, it's kind of putting the cart before the horse. It'd be nice to be educated, have the community uh, have the ability to find out some things about the, uh, the aquifer before the vote is actually taken. And uh, some breaking news is that the Muhammad Valley Water Authority just today decided to postpone their vote until after our event, and Savoy did last week. So there are now two units of government that, um, that have postponed it. And I'd also like to mention that there's five different units of government today that are having these deliberations. So We'd normally have more people here uh, to, to ask for a postponement, but they're actually elsewhere at the time. Actually six if you count the Muhammad Valley Water, Water Authority, which was earlier this afternoon. Okay, now I'd like to emphasize that the people that we're dealing with uh, in terms of running Clinton Landfill, they, they're tricky people. They've tricked a lot of people already. Um, they tricked uh, Dewitt County into locating this in the first place, citing it, um, because it was a municipal landfill that later evolved into a chemical waste landfill without what some people would say a proper siting procedure. Uh, they've also uh, tricked the people in Dewitt County about asbestos, promising that at the, when the original municipal landfill was cited that they'd never put asbestos in it. But then when they couldn't continue their operations in Peoria and they went to plan B to put the chemical waste unit in DeWitt County, they went back on their pledge not to put asbestos in. And if you look, you can find, uh, I believe it's four different schools and the University of Illinois uh, asbestos sitting in their, uh, their landfill. Uh, they've, they've tricked the IEPA a number of times uh, and the IEPA has reversed rulings it's made uh, when they realized they were tricked, although it was too late then, <laughs> uh, that things were already in place and they were putting chemical waste in. And so I'm just saying that uh, people that have tricked people so many times, I think you might want to take a very clear look at what's going on and take a little bit of ec extra time to do so before, you know, we, we may get tricked once again. Okay, now as to uh, the table I passed around. Um, as you can see, uh, MGP uh, waste, manufactured gas plant waste, there's the 30 tons of it there that we've talked about in the past. It was going in in 2011 and it went in very fast. Uh, three quarters of that waste went in in that very first year uh, when not many people in the public knew what was going on. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been trying to go to the EPA website and look at the various inspection reports and it turns out um, there's only uh, the April 16th, 2013 inspection report is only the second one that's on the web. This is in 2013. The thing has been operating 2011 and 2012. And in that second one that's on the web, uh, the inspector himself 
while he's there at the landfill, says he sees a truck that's dumping MGP waste. He's, he, it's dumping waste from an MGP uh, site into the, chem, uh, the chemical waste uh, unit. And so uh, he's actually witnessing an illegal dumping. You have one minute, Mr. Noreen. Okay, the, the point is that um, uh, MGP waste is regulated by the federal government and they don't allow it to go into the ground. It has to be treated first. We saw that in Fifth and Hill. It has to be remediated before it can go into a landfill, even a hazardous landfill. Even if they had the chemical waste unit there as a hazardous waste landfill, they couldn't put the uh, MGP source material in without it uh, being below a certain level, which would normally uh, require remediation. And they've admitted in the uh, documents that accompany this cons uh, consent decree that at least two times that it was over the limit. So they broke the law two times. And the problem is that the, the things in uh, the MGP waste attack the liner. They're not compatible with HTP liners. A lot of the compounds, the BTX compounds, which are benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, all of those attack the liner as well as napoline and other things. So uh, there's a very good argument for that waste to come out. And if you look at who put it in in the first place, they should share liability in having it removed because those companies know that they had MGP waste. They know it cannot go into a landfill. And they trucked it and put it into Clinton anyway. So they fooled the operators, or the operators may have colluded and let them in. But that stuff should not be there. And the federal government should know about this because it's their regulations that are being violated. And I don't see how we can have a consent decree that will violate the federal regulations. Okay, your time is up. I would like to ask you, you said about asbestos being buried, but that's not on your chart here? That's so right. is that a different year? No, it's just a different category. They have a separate category um, for asbestos. And uh, when the operator, when the uh, inspector goes in, he checks the different logs. and. Uh, He's reported what is in the asbestos log, but for some reason, I'm not sure if it's, they may have put it in the municipal land side, landfill side. I don't know uh, where they put it. Um, but uh, in the uh, inspection report for, that I have uh, on the, uh, that that chart came from and that I emailed you the link to, you can go to that particular inspection report and it'll talk about the asbestos waste that's in there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Diane? At this educational meeting on the 19th, who is, are the official presenters at that meeting? Well, that's a question you'd have to ask uh, Claudia Lenhoff. Our, our meeting is actually tomorrow to finish out the planning of it, and I unfortunately missed one of the planning meetings in the okay, summer. Okay, I'll, I'll ask her. Thank you. We did have um, someone come from healthcare consumers in favor testify in favor of us passing the consent decree. That was Jenny Putman. Oh, Jenny Putman was here to pass out the leaflets. Um, well, she did say she that she supported it. And my understanding from talking with, Cla with um, Claudia is that they support the consent decree, but they understand that this is just the beginning of a process that we need to work on stronger laws. Well, Jenny told me that the uh, Champaign County Health Consumers actually is neutral on the issue, and I'm asking for an extension of time. Um, okay, so you're doing it on behalf of yourself rather on than... Be on behalf okay. of myself, right. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. I'd also like to point out <laughs> that some of the questions Aaron was asking uh, are answered in that, uh, that document about exactly what is in the, the, the unit. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Odessa Vogel does not wish to um, speak, but she is opposed to the ordinance rezoning the parcel on Matthews Avenue from R2 to R4. Bishop King James Underwood does not wish to speak, but is concerned about the sewer problems at the Ellis subdivision. Dr. Evelyn Underwood um, did you want to did you want to speak? At the time of the oh okay all right well 
it is past 8.15, but we'll move on. Um, next is the unfinished business ordinance number 2015-07-066, an ordinance amending the zoning map of the city of Urbana, rezoning a 0.187 acre parcel at 703 North Matthews Avenue from R2 single family residential to the R4 medium density multiple family residential district. Bill. Um, yeah. Out of a uh, long standing friendship with the current owner and his family and past financial dealings with him and potential future financial dealings, I think um, because of the uh, potential for appearances of a conflict of interest or an actual conflict, I will recuse myself from discussion and voting on this issue. Okay. Good evening. So just to quickly review the case, it's 703 North Matthews, an organization, See You at Home, which provides relief for um, economically challenged populations in the area, is proposing to put in a, or is requesting a special use permit for a home for adjustment for a transitional housing for women at the, prop at the property. To do that, they will also have to request a rezoning from R2 single family residential to R4 medium density multiple family residential. The reason that they are requesting that rezoning is because that is the uh, lowest intensity uh, residential zoning, zoning district that they'd be allowed to apply for the use for which they're applying. So this is a joint application of a rezoning from R2 to R4 and upon, the success, upon an approved rezoning a special use permit to operate a, a home for adjustment as defined in the zoning ordinance. So the, this case was previously heard on July 13th. Uh, the council, well, first it was approved by the Urbana Plan Commission on June 25th, and then the council heard this on July 13th. Uh, and there was a discourse between the applicant and the council regarding uh, mainly among the issues of community outreach and how much input the neighborhood had for having some of their questions answered, having information uh, exchanged between the two sides about concerns or uh, different uh, different elements related to how the how the proposal would fit in with the surrounding neighborhood and it was uh, suggested that the applicant should seek some further outreach and communication uh, between the next meeting so uh, continuance was extended uh, to this date between now and then there was a meeting at the Urbana City Building on August 10th provided for residents to uh, talk with the applicant as well as several members of CU at home and a member of the covenant which is also participating in the application that was uh, that did get a chance to have some information provided and some exchange of uh, viewpoints and some conversations although it was a more low uh, uh, an event with lower attendance and that but that did allow for an event on August 22nd to be scheduled which was a public cookout it was notice was provided to people in many city blocks it was just some food that was provided and a chance to speak with the applicant and anyone could come and uh, provide their input provide their information or seek information uh, the applicant felt uh, Melody Jackson who was here tonight to answer any questions did feel that uh, the event went uh, went well considering at least uh, in terms of providing better, uh, people had a chance to voice their opinion. They had a chance to, uh, dis to uh, I think, to say what they wanted to do in the neighborhood and that it was limited to the single family home of renovating it of the inside, not replacing it or demolishing it, but just renovating mostly the interior to make it uh, habitable for you know, no more than eight women as well and how certain effects such as parking or uh, the intensity of use or you know attendance or safety issues how those uh, would be handled and uh, you know I, I understand Mary Bro Ms. Brooks who spoke earlier had uh, submitted some questions that she wanted to you know that she was asking of the applicant and uh, I know the applicant would be 
very able to answer those questions uh, if she were to, if, they, if she were asked them. Um, I, I, I do understand that some of the people who attended the event or who have spoken with city staff uh, obviously have expressed opposition or concern tonight or might be here to speak as well. But um, we are here tonight just because of the current status of the case in which there has been more dialogue and there has been more um, exchanging of information, I think, to better account for the proposals, uh, the proposed homes place in the surrounding neighborhood. So with that, the staff recommendation is the same for allowing, uh, for recommending approval of the rezoning as well as uh, the special use permit with the condition for the special use permit that the site is not redeveloped to a higher density and that the home does not exceed the maximum allowable occupancy of eight residents and one staff member and that the petitioner provide a parking plan subject to the review and approval of the zoning administrator and city engineer depicting at least three uh, parking spaces either on site or within 600 feet of the subject property. So um, are there any, and those, those were recommendations forwarded by the plan commission. Are there any questions? Yes. Diane, go ahead. Just to clarify, the conditions that you just mentioned are attached to the special use permit and they're not attached to the property so that a, uh, another property owner would not be bound by either of these conditions. Uh, those are, the two conditions are strictly for the special use permit, correct? I don't believe we can apply uh, conditions for a rezoning. Right. The rezoning has okay. to be either Thank you. yes or no. Anyone else? Mike? Just uh, kind of a silly question, but um, so Google Maps uh, spells this street with one T. Um, so are we right or are they? It is uh, one T, I believe. Just if it's a zoning matter, we probably ought to be particular. I would just say that we ought to research that. And uh, I would think the city has it spelled correctly, but. Uh, Could be wrong. Check into that. Google probably prides themselves in street names. So. If I may, okay. I, I, it is with one T. I suppose we could um, blame Microsoft for autocorrect. <laughs> so Google's right and Microsoft is wrong. That's right. <laughs> Matthews is with one T in the city of Urbana. <laughs> yes, that's, that's, right. that's absolutely that's true. true. Uh, anyone else have a question or a comment? Uh, this Eric? is just a procedural comment since yes. this is unfinished business. Uh, do we need a motion, or is this already on the? Uh, has this already been moved? In the no, summer? we're talking about it. Um, we, oh, so we have to deal with it, so we're waiting for a motion, if there is a motion. Well, right. I'll just to uh, set the procedural wheels going. I'll move approval. I'd, and I would second that. Okay, motion by Jacobson, seconded by Roberts, to approve ordinance number 2015-07-066. So, any other discussion? Yes. Mr. Ammons. So, when we move something from um, a, a lesser class, if you will, of zoning and move to, so from R2 to R4, um, is this an increase in value in the property? Well, the, the, the property value is one of the considerations taken into the LaSalle criteria, which is kind of a, a set of six questions for any rezoning, which is in the original memo. I can pull that up if you would like me to, but, um, you know, to, in the effort to save time. The increase in value, it, the, the value uh, change of rezoning it, uh, hard to say. It, it would depend on the prospect of how likely it could be re, uh, redeveloped to you know, that limit, that small circumstance that it might, someone might acquire it and uh, redevelop it to a multi-unit uh, base, but um, I'm not certain how much of an effect it would have on the property value given the, the current acquisition would keep the, the existing structure intact. And um, when we talk about spot zoning, when I look at the map, I was talking to Alderman Marlin earlier before the, the meeting and I'm looking at the map and seeing all these uh, high density areas of R2 that um, do not have any other, they don't, we don't approve spot zoning. Why, why would we approve this in a, in a situation of spot zoning and not approve it in other locations? Well, the, 
you know, the, I, I believe your R2 is the, the lower, the lower uh, intensity uh, zoning in which, yeah, it is. It would be mostly surrounded by R2. Uh, that concern was brought up during the plan commission hearing about the, the fact that it is a, a spot zoning. Uh, when taken into all the other consideration of the, uh, the location that, that works for the mission of CU at Home, that you know, the, the services would be able to provide for the occupants of the home and close to uh, the hospital, close to tra uh, mass transit uh, and transportation, close to churches and areas that they do outreach. Uh, in the context of all those different elements, the plan commission decided that while it technically is, it could be considered a spot zoning, that it was uh, appropriate to approve um, with all the circumstances under consideration. Uh, Dennis and then Diane and um, the packet didn't include um, material that we received earlier uh, which, which uh, I think is kind of useful to look at and that would be the um, um, the overview of the property uh, compared to other properties surrounding it and as I remember this was backed up against um, the railroad track and some other um, higher zoned and different zoned districts so do you have a uh, can you pull up the um the first site memo? perspective view of the map um the map of the uh, I believe sky map of the uh, area there might have been one in the first uh council memo that i'm pulling up right now yeah that's what i'm thinking it was perhaps in the uh, planning commission's review uh that's um, now with the exhibits attached, and as I remember, um, this was not was this was not a property that was like just um, in the center of an R two district, but is at the very edge of an R two district. Um, let me see if I can. Um, which is basically one of the reasons why I didn't find this to be a problematic rezoning request, and the second thing that. Um, that I noticed in the original conversation that we had was that it was a successful use of a building that um, is has some historic nature. It was a single family residence for some time, but was in danger of um, not being maintained well. And it seems to me that this reuse would actually preserve the existing structure rather than asking that it's some kind of new um, complex is being built on this property, which I think it actually somewhat enhances the request because it's not um, remaking or remodeling the um, uh, the existing structure to become um, somehow morphed into something modern and um, more with a larger footprint on the property. So, um, sorry, my request see. is difficult for you. Guys. No, not at all. I mean, so uh, I, I wanted to. Diane is next. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, are you finished, Dennis? I'm done. Yeah. Did I you get your question answered? Okay, Diane, and then Aaron. <coughs> I my <coughs> excuse me. My concern about this request is number one the the issue of it is spot zoning and it's it's changing the zoning from R two to R four on a single parcel that is surrounded by our two um, residences. And if you look at every other part of the city, it is not something we would do, I don't think, in any other neighborhood in the city. In fact, we've fought it actively in other neighborhoods in the city. So I keep asking myself, or telling, you know, I, what, what keeps coming back to me is that a use is transient. It, it can be this very, you know, worthwhile use today but it may not be there next year and then the zoning is is more permanent once it goes to r4 it's not going back to r2 that's pretty much a given and in r4 you have many more options in terms of your use including multifamily dwellings um, <coughs> library museum gallery that's very nice um, professional business office uh, fire stations parking garages parking lots um, electrical substations that's a conditional use or um, nursing homes assisted living facilities that's another conditional use so there's a much wider range of potential uses there and the uses are transient the zoning is not so what I when I ask myself would I 
approve this kind of zoning change in South Urbana, I would say no. If it was in East Urbana, I'd vote no. If it was in Central West Urbana, I would vote no. And I, I'm finding it hard to support this in um, North Urbana. But that's my concern, is this issue of changing the zoning on one parcel when it is very much different from the rest of the neighborhood. Because that's a permanent change more than the use itself. Dennis, did you want me to go to the other map showing the existing land use? It well, it was on the edge. Well, it does show that uh, this parcel is actually uh, touching um, properties that have completely different uses. Yes, they are north. Uh, this is north of the railroad track as opposed to south. And if you want to use the railroad track as you know, the protective barrier, uh, you are jumping it. But uh, because of the because of the value of the use that, and because the, the property itself is not going to be changed except for on the interior, and because there are many homes in probably the R2 district that have more than one family member living in it, there are probably some homes in this area that have, you know, multiple, you know, families, you know, ten kids perhaps in one of the homes. It's not like I, I don't see really that this is like a grievous um, uh, error for a request. Okay, uh, Aaron. So I want to say to Marilyn and Sister Karen and everyone who has been involved with this at CU, uh, I've had several meetings with all of you. You have uh, been forthright with your questions and open and honest about what it is that you want to do. I really believe in what you're trying to do, and from the bottom of my heart, I do. But I have a larger concern that you all are, are sort of getting wrapped up into and with the dream that you have which I actually support, um, been working on these types of issues for a long time. The larger issue that we're facing about rezoning and about the, um, the concerns that the constituents, my constituents have in particular in this particular area are larger implications of what happens once you change zoning. Once it moves from one thing to another, and it's very difficult for it to go back to, to something else. What happens then if and when this doesn't work out, it doesn't maintain itself, and now somebody comes along and says, hey, we want to make this an electrical substation, right, you know, or whatever it is that they want to do. I have my eye, I live in this area, as well as the constituents that I represent, are extremely concerned about where this is going and where it could possibly lead. And so while I absolutely applaud the effort, in, a, in this particular issue, I don't have an overwhelming support for my constituents to say, hey, go forward. It's about a 50-50 situation, and there's all these other larger implications that we have. And I, I, I thank you all. You asked, I asked you all to do the cookout. You did it. I asked you all to, to postpone the meetings. You did all those things. You answered all those questions. But these larger implications, I can't look past them. So in this, because of that, unfortunately, I'll have to vote no on this. Eric? I want to address the spot zoning issue because I live in an area that's spot zoned. That is, I live directly across the street from an apartment building, my fa and my apartment and my family home is also directly north of the apartment building that you owned, Diane. Uh, and uh, so it's okay. It's okay to have this kind of mixture if there's a good reason for it. Our neighborhood has stabilized as a mixed neighborhood. We have a mixture of single family homes, owner occupied homes, and apartment buildings. And as long as they are, you know, well done, it can work. The, um, so I, I just, I guess I've really thought hard about this particular issue. I thought hard about the women who would be served. Naomi used to be the director of a woman's fund, and she never violated her confidences in terms of telling me, you know, anything directly about them, but I heard anonymized stories. And these are people, largely, who are deserving of transition housing and need it. Uh, the stories that I heard were abusive husbands, irresponsible husbands, uh, or boyfriends, 
They were getting away from real, not only from abuse, but real physical danger, and they needed a place. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I went to the cookout, and I heard the questions asked, and I heard the questions answered. No boyfriends, no visitors of the opposite sex. Um, the uh, a very successful operation for men elsewhere in the community. Um, I asked myself whether I would, what would I do if this were my neighborhood? And actually I know what I would do. I absolutely know what I could do because uh, we live catty corner from St. Patrick's Church and St. Pat's at one time was going to, was thinking about moving a um, supported housing onto their property right next to the church. And Naomi and I went to a meeting and said that's great with us, that was within a block of us. So actually it didn't happen because their congregation didn't want it to happen. But, uh, but we as neighbors were, were happy for that. I think as I went to the meeting on the property and I looked I felt that a well-maintained use of this property, uh, as is proposed, would actually be much more of an asset to the community than the, um, than the, uh, you know, than a vacant property. So I intend to support this. I intend to support this because I believe in the mission. I intend to support it because the. Uh, because the exper our, our experience in our neighborhood says that supported housing can exist very well uh, adjacent to um, adjacent to more standard residential housing and um, so anyway that's uh, that's where I am Diane just for the record, I would like to say that the buildings I used to own is owned R3, which is single and two-family residential, not R4, which is being proposed here. And I'm basing my uh, opinion uh, on my 27 years of living in West Urbana, where probably the single biggest issue in that neighborhood over the years has been um, the conflict, and it has been a conflict between apartments versus single-family homes and the desire to preserve the single-family nature of the neighborhood. And anyone who's seen the Luna list for a week is aware of that. So our um, properties were actually homes converted to duplexes next door to you. So that's for the record. Anyone else? Okay, we have a motion by uh, Jacobson, seconded by Roberts. Oh, uh, Mike Madigan wants to say something. So some of my friends are for this and some of my friends are against this. So I'm going to be with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> you may also be the swing boat. <laughs> uh, well, that's abundantly clear. That's why I thought I'd speak up. Thanks a lot, Bill. <clears throat> uh, but I, I guess what it boils down to, I think both sides make compelling arguments. Uh, but I think in a zoning matter, uh, I think my, uh, my test uh, should be what does the alderman from that ward think? So I will be supporting the alderman from that ward. Okay, would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? No. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Madigan? No. Ms. Marlin? No. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? No. Okay, so that's um, three to three, correct? No, four to four, four to two. Well, I guess I miscounted. Okay, so the motion is defeated. Thank you. So we don't have to deal then with um, the next ordinance because that's a special use permit. Okay, uh, let's move on to. Reports of um, standing committees, we have the Committee of the Whole. I think we'll skip number A and we should go to number B, correct? 
who was doing the Committee of the Whole. Is that you, Bill? Uh, it was Diane. Sorry. Go ahead. No. It was oh, it was Mike Madigan. Would you like to start with B, please? So we can get to A when the people come back in the room. Sure. Uh, item B on the uh, Committee of the Whole Agenda is Ordinance Number 2015-08-090, an ordinance authorizing the sale of certain real estate, a portion of 108 East Water Street. Uh, the committee uh, forwarded this uh, ordinance to the City Council with a recommendation for approval, and on behalf of the committee, I so move. Okay, motion by Madigan, uh, seconded by Smythe. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Madigan? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Mayor Pressing? Yes, that motion carries. Okay, we have um, the people who are going to talk about the landfill back in the room. So, um, would you like to start, Steve Carter? Steve Carter, 609 West Green uh, Street in Champaign. And um, I'll keep my comments at a broader level because we have two attorneys here and, and I, can't, I can't compete with, with two lawyers in terms of the details of the uh, agreement. But I just wanted to point out that uh, you know, we've been, we've had some success. We started this four years ago, 2011, just before I retired. And it's provided a nice retirement for me, too, in case my wife wants me out of the house, why I can always work on aquifer issues. <laughs> but we've, we've had some success uh, because we've had a lot of people involved. And I don't think people would have listened to us, except for the fact that, you know, we have 14 or 15 local governments who have all worked together. Uh, Mayor Pressing has been great about showing up at educational events. Uh, the key meeting was one with the governor's staff and the general counsel and director of IEP, IEPA uh, in May, and shortly after that, uh, Illinois EPA uh, modified their permit that required uh, the landfill to stop taking MGP waste. Uh, so we've had, we've had some impact, again, because of the people working together. One of the things, when we first started out, uh, we, came, we got involved at 11.59. Uh, if you recall, the federal government was getting ready to, to uh, issue a permit allowing the storage of PCBs in the Clinton landfill above the aquifer. And so our, big, our biggest issue was how are we going to stop them from doing this because it looked like it was imminent. And characteristic of the effort uh, all these four years, we had good bipartisan support. Both Senator Durbin and Senator Kirk uh, indicated to EPA that, you know, maybe they didn't have to hurry that approval to give us time to do some other things. Uh, since then, you know, we've had support from both the Republican and the Democratic side, counties, uh, cities, uh, large urban areas, rural areas, agriculture, uh, city folks. I mean, it's been a, a, a fun project to work on because so many people have come together uh, to try to save the quality of their water. Um, we were able to hire two of the best environmental attorneys in the state. Uh, Joe Hooker, the deputy assistant, deputy city attorney, assistant city attorney in Champaign, uh, has spent tremendous time working on behalf of the coalition. We have attorneys from many of the other coalition members who have reviewed all these documents as well. The Attorney General's office uh, weighed in relatively early on our side when they heard our case. Uh, they agreed with us and so the Attorney General's office has been supportive uh, as well as e Illinois EPA. Uh, we're at the point now where we have a very narrow uh, lawsuit uh, pending. Uh, so this lawsuit is not going to save the world. All it was going to do was require the landfill to go back through a siting process with the DeWitt County Board. So the focus of the lawsuits were very narrow, and so it's understandable that, that uh, the consent decree uh, ending the lawsuit, the settlement, is very narrow too. It's not there to solve all the issues with the landfill, uh, and we knew that going in. Uh, this is a long-term effort that we're going to have to make. The lawsuit was one mechanism to try to stop things, stop 
the PCBs, stop the manufactured gas plant waste. Uh, it looks like we're going to be successful in doing that, but how do, we, how do we protect the landfill over the long term? There are a lot of other things we need to be doing in terms of additional legislation, uh, looking at other landfills that are in place and what's happening to them. This isn't the only landfill. Looking at uh, Chinook Air Force Base and the chemicals that the Air, uh, Air Force has uh, deposited there. So there are a lot of issues we need to be concerned about, and we need to start working on all of those things but we'll be successful again only if we can keep uh, the coalition together and get the, keep the support that we have there. Part of the support has been uh, the work of the citizens too. Uh, the watch group has been very instrumental in, in raising concerns. They're the ones that are on the ground, so uh, they've been great partners to work with as well. We just happen to disagree on, on the consent decree. Uh, Healthcare consumers has become a very active supporter of this, uh, as well as other environmental groups. So there's a lot of folks that are interested in this, uh, but I think the time has come to let's settle this, uh, the lawsuit, let's focus on the other things that need to be done to protect our aquifer in the long term. That's all I have. Thank you. Any questions for Steve Carter? Yeah. Eric Jacobson. So. It's a very complicated issue, but I think it boils down to something that may be stated very simply in terms of the two sides on the consent decree. I think everybody agrees that it was very bad for the MGP source material to go into the landfill. And, uh, and I think everybody agrees that in the long term it ought to come out. Uh, but the question seems to be, is it more, is that end result more likely to be effected by agreeing to this decree and then moving on that other front, or is it more likely to be effected by rejecting the consent decree? Uh, at least that's how I see it, and so I just want to ask your, your uh, firstly, have I phrased the issue approximately right? And secondly, if I have, what, which, what, what is your opinion? Well, you know, the attorneys might be uh, better able to, to talk about, well, what's the likelihood of, uh, of a lawsuit being successful in that? But because, you know, my, from my perspective, I think it's unlikely that the MGP waste will be removed. Uh, as much as we would like it to be. It was placed there uh, with the permission of Illinois PA. And uh, in the consent decree in includes additional testing, which is very important to test, do the testing of the area. And so if it looks like there's some contamination, then the Illinois EPA can step in and force the removal. And I think, uh, I think that's probably a reasonable thing to do, that if it looks like there's a problem, then Illinois can step in, Illinois EPA can step in and force it. To remove it without having a problem being demonstrated right now runs the risk of damaging uh, the, the liner and all the other infrastructure that's there now. Plus, uh, you know, who's going to force uh, a company to remove material that Illinois EPA allowed them to place there to begin with. So my own feeling is unless there's an issue, I don't think anyone's going to force them to remove the small amount of NGP waste. It'd be great if they would do that, but you know, just from a practical standpoint, I just don't see that happening. Dennis. Yes, thanks. So, so we have gotten uh, really a, a really good um, set of documents from uh, the various people who had opinions about it. And we also have here, and uh, um, I guess it's a, uh, for immediate release, so this is like a press bulletin um, from Chris Coster, um, and it has the City of Champaign's logo on it. And it's basically a summary of, I guess, the, po the position of the, um, um, the participants who are urging the adoption of this. So I just want to ask you a few questions about it. Um, Mr. Mr. Hooker is the one who wrote that, yes, so I Joe is here and would be happy to respond to that. All right, I'm all right. sure. Well, would you want me to wait would be for okay. maybe, be, maybe yeah, I should if, ask for if, him? If Joe Hooker wrote it, we better ask Joe Hooker. All right. All right. So thank you very much. Um, do you want both attorneys to come up? Yes, please do come up. It's good to be back with all 
of you. Uh, this is Albert Edinger. He's one of the attorneys who's been working on this for us. Uh, I thought it'd be helpful to see that there is a real person with a lot of expertise who's been toiling on this on our behalf uh, since. Well, thank you very much. Well, okay. Well, thank you very much. We've heard good things about you. So yeah, and got and, lots uh, of questions. Uh, okay. So, okay. what questions do you have? I, I I'd be happy to r summarize some things, but yeah, any questions you okay. have? Okay. Um, Dennis is first, then Diane, then Bill. And I'm sure I won't ask all the questions, so I'll, I'll probably leave plenty behind. Um, just you know, there are just some things. Uh, first, first of all, we get you know one of the documents you know talks about like how excellent the the lawyer team is behind you know the uh, proposal and how they built it over time and all that, which I appreciate. Um, it doesn't matter to me so much that I guess I'm concerned about expertise, and that's great. But I'm even if Colombo was doing this, I would hope that it would be done adequately and be uh, a um, something that we could stand on and and count on for. Um, uh, being of use to the communities involved. Um, you know, we, okay, so some of the points that are in this document that are the press release makes various claims uh, or it summarizes the, the, um, what Clinton Landfill will do and agrees to do and what we're going to be doing. So it says here that it agrees to cover the MGP waste already deposited in the chemical waste unit pursuant to the earlier Illinois EPA approval with a 12 inch layer of impermeable clay soil. And then it's going to be covered by municipal waste. Is that correct? Correct. So, um, you know, any stray dog can cut, can dig a hole at 12 inches deep. Why is 12 inches considered adequate? Why isn't it 30 feet or something really significant? Why are we uh, are we settling for something that's just a thin coating that really has no value? Uh, I'd say no. And 12 inches is kind of like the daily cover notion too. And what you have to appreciate is this is over a very large area. So why would uh, we and, care? And why would we care about the area if we wanted to have adequate coverage? Well, uh, I, I guess my response to you is I don't think it's insignificant, and, and I think the judgment was. Uh, from our attorney David Wentworth is is the one who has the more expertise in landfill regulations and he uh, was responsible for negotiating that and he views that as pretty significant uh, uh, to 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 accomplish the objectives which are basically to keep water and, and other waste material out of that uh, the waste that'll remain there now I wish that Chris Storr was here to, because he's an expert on landfill and sedimentation and seepage and I think I would like to re really know about what he would say about 12 inches if that was adequate well and I, I guess one thing again to bear in mind and I I, I appreciate the uh, ongoing debate about whether this is adequate or not adequate uh, this is not something we really could accomplish with our lawsuit in any event if we continue to litigate and that's an important thing to remember uh, and I don't want everybody to lose sight of that because I, I have to say uh, from time to time I think we are somewhat losing sight of what our lawsuit was all about which is to get back to the DeWitt County Board for a local siting hearing and this consent degree was a lot more than that it basically avoids the need to even do that they mm -hmm. commit to not accepting either of these waste streams forever anywhere over the aquifer in DeWitt County. Uh, a pretty dramatic result in my view given the limited nature of our lawsuit. So, uh, but to get back to your question, uh, Mr. Wentworth, uh, his, his opinion was that that was a pretty significant uh, concession for them to make and, a, and an important concession for and them. And you're saying that 12 inches is what they would normally drop on the landfill in a day just as a, as a typical cover for uh, Deposited waste. I, I that, that's kind of my understanding, and I I'm, I'm not the best per person mm -hmm. to speak to that. Unfortunately, David had to go to to normal. They're considering this tonight yeah. too, and we're kind of spreading ourselves a little thin. Okay, and I appreciate that. So I, I I appreciate the question. I understand the question. The only thing I would add is, um, the, I, I'm a lawyer. I'm not going to tell you about 12 inches or 8 inches or 16 inches. I will right. say, however, the Illinois Attorney General's office did consult with their landfill experts and these are the sort the, the recommendations came out of the AG's office also. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. All that right, had so technical expertise. It just depends on what's typical rather than maybe what's re what would really be a great cover. All right. Um, the second, then point four on the in the memo says uh, that Clinton Landfill in Incorporated agrees to have a property license, a properly licensed environmental testing professional test the groundwater at the landfill for presence of toxic chemicals commonly found in MGB waste on a semi-annual basis. Okay, so that sounds good because we have somebody who's going to be testing, and it's going to be a professional person. So it's not going to be the landfill company itself. It's going to be what an independent company. Well, that's it, do it, that? it can be actually a, a company affiliated with area waste, and and that's the existing law. And some of us want to explore changing that law, but that is the way the the current law works. It does have to be somebody certified and licensed with the state. They have to have the, the you know the right credentials to have the expertise to evaluate the test results, and they have to report those. And and so. And do we have the right to? Um, Approve the choice of who, which professional. So we no, we do not, and and we don't under current law. That's okay. not something we we could accomplish in our view with our li with our litigation as well. Okay. And, and reasonable people think that that ought to change, but we can't accomplish that with our litigation. All right. And then, um, uh, if uh, who pays for that service? The landfill does. The landfill is going to pay for that service. Yes. All right. And if there is a leakage. Um, who remediates? Who pays for the remediation? Well, the landfill would. Okay. Sure. All right. And so we've got a, a landfill in Urbana, and we've been, um, we have test wells, and we've been um, watching it, and we get a report every year. And I can't remember, I think I brought this up before, that I think it cost us $17,000 a year to uh, monitor the wells, and, and uh, we've had to do some remediation and dig ditch digging to accumulate to to collect some seepage out of the landfill. So I think it wouldn't be a surprise to see some seepage, and I'm just wondering that's a concern for me. Finally, uh, it says here that the state of Illinois, through the Illinois Attorney's General Office and the Illinois EPA, reserve the right to pursue any future criminal or civil violations related to any future contamination of the environment from the MGP waste that's already been accepted by the Clinton landfill and any remedies available under law, including but not limited to the removal of the waste material causing contamination. So does that then give us full right to pursue um, removal if there is contamination seepage? The, the individual members of the coalition would not have that right. Any citizen would have that right. DeWitt County would have that right. The state's attorney in DeWitt County would have that right and the Illinois Attorney General and the uh, Illinois EPA would have that right. And it was the considered view of our attorneys that that's a pretty unusual remedy and that unless the Attorney General and the Illinois EPA were actively involved in seeking that, that's very unlikely to happen in any event. So there's no chance that there's going to be anybody who's going to be successfully requesting the, the, the removal of contaminants. No, that's not correct. I just, as I said, the uh, Illinois, uh, the Attorney General's office and the Illinois EPA and any affected citizen would mm -hmm. be able to seek that. Any citizen probably in DeWitt County who gets their water from the Muhammad Aquifer, uh, the DeWitt County State's Attorney would certainly be able to seek that right. Uh, the, the rights are pretty broad generally for the citizens who have that right. And, and why would the city not want, to, why would a city or a county that's over the aquifer and being affected not want to be a participant in a lawsuit? Well, I, I don't think it's something we didn't want. It's just something that, that we, didn't we weren't get. able to uh, get them to agree to. Okay, so that's like a really key thing here. You're, so we're depending really on a poor, uh, poor farmer or, or average Joe who's, Got well, a, got a yeah. Let me let me let me clarify one point. All of the coalition members can continue to file a citizen's lawsuit, and there's other kind of civil remedies too. We can continue to seek mm -hmm. any civil or criminal remedies available to yeah. us under law. The one thing we can't do ourselves is is seek an order of exhumation. But we have the right to start the process and bring this to the attention of the authorities. Is it possible to uh, seek damages without asking for remediation? I mean, what if what if we th what if there's seepage? Can the different communities then seek damages for that leak? Well, if the law provides for that, the answer is clearly yes. And, and, do, and if the law, law doesn't provide, provide for, for it. The answer is clearly no. And, and which mean, law are we going to be using to determine that? All right. 
the, the, it's getting kind of hypothetical as to what will happen under various circumstances. I think we can count on a leakage eventually. Okay. Well, so we're talking about a leak. Well, I, I don't know what we can count on eventually. This waste doesn't last forever, and what the kind of waste it will be if and when it ever leaks is a is a. I, I'm not prepared to speculate on. But let's say it leaks in 20 years. Let's say uh, as we've heard, as, as the, the, the agreement does, you could seek a remedy for it. Currently, you probably could not seek damages now because there is no damage remedy unless it was directly your water that was affected. There are cases that would have been brought for affecting water, and if you could prove damages to your water, you could do that. The farmer could prove damages to his water. You could seek money damages for the replacement water. I was involved in a case in southern Illinois involving atrazine and water supplies, and Syngenta did pay a substantial amount of money in, to cities in order to redress their problems from, from atrazine getting into their water. So a city could benefit from that if a well owned by the city was contaminated by seepage? Uh, yes, they could. They could sue for money damages. But, uh, are, but they're they, not being, for money damages, but they but they're prohibited from seeking criminal. Um, no, that's well, not. Well, we, we, you couldn't seek criminal criminal well, remedies anyway. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. I'm just wondering. I mean, you know, the city, the city or community or or county is uh, is being is suffering, uh, and the community in general is going to be could be suffering from the seepage ultimately to, into the aquifer. So, yeah. the remedy would only be available to a individual party. Here's thinking. Well, it, the, the remedy is only ever available to the individual party who's damaged. who's damaged. So if you could prove damages, you could potentially seek a remedy, but that's, the, you know. Hypothetical, I, okay. Uh, that's, that's kind of hypothetical. The only thing this does, I mean, let's, what they got out of this deal is that you can't seek exhumation based on, well, the, the, the parties to this, the municipalities cannot seek that the waste be exhumed. You can ask for anything else. Mm -hmm. And also there are s other theories, not, well, th I don't think the cities would probably be doing it, but um, there's federal law, RECRA, that would allow uh, remedying a, an imminent danger. It's called imminent endanger uh, endangerment under RECRA if you have a resource, a potential resource damage from something like a leaking landfill, and it has been used. In fact, the group just won a case in Maine on a theory like that uh, very recently. There have been a lot of cases under RECRA where there's an imminent endangerment. Uh, so there are other remedies that other people will be, uh, will be able to use. However, that is one thing. The immediate coalition partners would not be able to seek that remedy, but the deal makes it possible to seek about every other remedy. Okay, I'll, I'll stop and allow the people okay. have that question. Diane. Um, one, obs one thing that came through to me after I read through this material is that it, it, it appears that some of the critical decisions that may be made by the DeWitt County Board would be, be taken out of their control and solidified Absolutely. in this consent decree. And as far as I'm concerned, the less they have to do with making decisions about this landfill the better considering their deplorable uh, history on this thing. Yeah, and that's precisely, I, I want to kind of set the framework. This is a bad situation for a lawyer to be in because I'm sort of arguing against the case I've been making for three years and, and frankly I don't want to argue too well because this is a public forum and I don't want all of this to be quoted in court a year later when I want to make the other argument or somehow the deal falls through and I do want to make this argument. So, so the, the basic point is, is our whole legal theory, and I, I represent the Sierra Club, that's been my main client since 1982. I've sued a lot more municipalities than I've represented. So I just want to say, the, the, we, convincing the Sierra Club to settle cases is not, an, is not an easy matter, and so I've done this a fair amount. You've got to look, though, at what you can realistically achieve with the legal theory you have. Our legal theory is that they got permission from the DeWitt County Board in 2002 to bu build a municipal landfill 
but then they went outside of that to build a type of landfill that they didn't have permission for. So happens that IEPA said that they did have permission and that they could issue the license anyway. So that's what the argument was about. Our remedy, if we win, we hit a home run. Right now, by the way, we're losing. Right now, the Pollution Control Board has thrown out your case and said, you can't do anything about the fact that they didn't require siting, do proper siting. You're, so, so we're losing. But okay, I'm, I'm great. I'm going to hit a home run next inning. But right now, if we win, if we win on that theory, that they have to go, they should have done the SB 172, where does that send us? Sends us back to the DeWitt County Board. Because of course, they're going to go back and say, oh, we just lost. It seems we need your permission. Now, give us the permission to put in the hazardous waste site as opposed to just the municipal waste site we had. So you're counting on now. If we win, what you get is the right to convince the De DeWitt County Board not to give that permission. Instead, what this deal gives us is the right to kill the possibility of any new MGP waste going in there for all eternity or any PCB waste going in there for all eternity. So, you know, I guess, yes, you gave up something. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, you, you've had to give up something. But in, in order to give up that little thing, the right to seek exhumation of the relatively small amount of waste that's gone in there, you have managed to block the DeWitt County Board from ever agreeing to put MG wa more MGP waste there or any PCB waste in there. Okay, thank you. Can oh, I go, go ahead. Um, and from here on out, the only waste, I mean, it's a, it's a, let's see, 135 acres municipal landfill and there's 22 and a half chemical acre chemical waste units. So they're going to fill it up with something. So from here on out, the only thing that can be there buried either in the chemical waste unit or the municipal solid waste unit is uh, municipal. municipal solid waste, non-hazardous special waste, certified non-special waste, and any other waste that could go in a regular landfill. And today that includes coal ash because coal ash is classified as non-hazardous waste, which is one of the things we need to change in the state law going Correct. forward. Okay. Correct. And, and, and let me just put that, say that a different way. What the consent decree does is says all you can put in this chemical waste unit that they designed a hazardous waste uh, conditions at considerable extra expense. So the notion that they're somehow lighting cigars and popping the corks out of their champagne li like this is a big victory for them, not a very accurate statement of where we're at, quite frankly. Uh, the only thing they can put in the chemical waste unit is something they've been allowed to put in the larger landfill, landfill number three, since 2002, or more technically since 2007, when the Illinois EPA granted them permission for landfill number three as a municipal solid waste landfill. So they lose all the benefit of the added investment in that chemical waste unit if we do this consent decree. And I guess another point I want to clarify, because I w it was reported to me that uh, there was a statement that I would suggest to you as a misstatement is the notion that they can never ever renew their request before the US EPA to bring these PCB contaminated waste there is completely inaccurate, okay? The notion that, that the sole source aquifer designation solved our problem is not accurate, okay? I mean, uh, and it, we've had a number of people say that again and again, repeating it doesn't make it accurate. It's not accurate. And let me amplify that. You now have materials, I think. You have this actual uh, regulation that has been discussed that purports to prevent them from ever again seeking requests from the US EPA for permission to put HP, or PCB contaminated waste regulated by the Toxic Substance Control Act. And what they always omit to mention is this unless clause. It's unless the stratum under the facility meets these certain requirements about uh, how quick materials can percolate through them, how impervious the soils are, uh, the rate at which contaminants can go through uh, the stratum as they describe it. 
And the fact of the matter is, and this is all a matter of public record that anyone can look at, the landfills consultants said they could meet those additional restrictions. So I don't want anybody to be misled. They had some experts saying, well, we can meet those. Yeah, there's some additional requirements now that it's a sole source aquifer, but guess what? We can meet those as well. And this was the source of a heated technical dispute between their consultant, Shaw Environmental. Uh, the, this is the folks they brought in with their US EPA application and KPRG and Associates, a very skillful, qualified expert hired by the Muhammad Valley Water Authority. So these two experts are battling it out in the record, so to speak, before the US EPA and they're filing one report and then a, a, and a rebuttal to that report and then a rebuttal to that report and until you read that you can't fully appreciate the back and forth and how two sets of experts can come to completely different conclusions about whether technical requirements are met but by golly they did come to different requirements and what's more troubling than that uh, is that it appears the US EPA sided with Shaw. They had their experts sunk, come in and, and basically parrot what Shaw said in their reports. So the notion that, you know, the sole source aquifer designation in some manner takes care of this or however it's been characterized is just simply inaccurate. And so that's a major benefit we get this with this consent decree. I couldn't disagree more strongly with that characterization. They agree to never, ever, ever again seek permission to put those, those kind of wastes anywhere in DeWitt County over the aquifer, not just in this facility, anywhere over the aquifer, regardless of whether they can meet those requirements or not. And bear in mind, their expert says they can. So I, I just wanted to clarify that particular misstatement. Okay, um, Bill Brown and then Eric and Charlie. Um, yeah, I think last time I, uh, was concerned about the extra, after it said it would only accept municipal solid waste, it also said non-hazardous special waste and certified non-hazardous waste, non-special waste. Um, but I think one of your memos earlier answered that because apparently when the landfill was originally permitted, the local siting gave them that ability to put the non-hazardous special waste and certified non-special waste in it besides just municipal waste, is that right? I think that's correct, but, but the, main, the main point to take away from this, I mean, we can get really kind of lost in the details of some of the language. The consent decree unmistakably says they can only accept waste that they can accept in a, solid, in a municipal solid waste landfill. And some of those wastes that you described are examples of the kind of waste they've always been able to accept in the larger landfill number three since the Witt County Board approved it way back in 2002 and the Illinois EPA granted its initial permit for landfill number three in 2007. And then the MTP waste that's there, the remediation waste, um, was it considered non-hazardous special waste? Do you know? It was before this new law was passed, yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. So the that new law and, and Could I, it have actually been disposed of in the unlined landfill then? No, it not, couldn't be an unlined or, landfill. Or I'm, uh, I'm sorry, the, the landfill that's not the chemical waste unit, the, yeah, the, the larger landfill. Yeah, there's a, yeah. No, the single line. Until that law was passed, and I think it was about a month ago now that the governor actually signed it, uh, manufactured gas plant source material was considered a non-hazardous special waste. And so that law was extremely helpful. I, I don't want to diminish the value of that law. And admittedly, that, that law makes it a little more difficult for them to perhaps to get approval by the DeWitt County Board because it appears now they would have to actually get approval for a hazardous waste landfill. Now, mind you, the chemical waste unit is already designed the hazardous waste landfill standards. So that kind of gives them a head start. And of course, the larger concern is this, this particular board is just completely unreliable about being sensitive to the to kind of environmental concerns that we all have about this, so. And then um, 
the HB 1326 was the law you were talking about. Yes. Um, originally, it was proposed to also include PCBs, and they, that wasn't in the final. Is that correct? There's nothing. Correct. Re yeah, we PCBs. had a, it wasn't our first choice, but frankly, w th those of us who were tracking it closely realized, boy, this is a big step forward, and uh, the Illinois EPA actually co-sponsored it or, or, or authorized it, and and uh, so that was a, it wasn't all we wanted, and I think we've made these remarks earlier. We want to accomplish a lot more with the legislation. Uh, a number of us think it would be prudent to have legislation that says no landfills over the, a sole source aquifer of any kind ever again. And I think we may be able to get there. I think we're in much better shape now because we have the sole source designation, but that's our ultimate goal. And then uh, just one more. If uh, the goal, if one of the goals is to make the tests, um, the test results public without having to FOIA them, um, what would you think would be the best mechanism to, to go? Well, we could either do them? a statutory change, or or we could probably accomplish that with a rule change. And I can't speak to how hard Albert probably has a better. I, none of those. I, neither of those approaches is easy. I'm I'm quite sure and. Well, first of all, I, I do FOIA requests all the time. I'm not sure why uh, on something like this, they, they only resist FOIA at IEPA if it embarrasses them. I don't see that the, these figures are going to embarrass them. So I've not had any trouble getting that. And I'm not sure, I, I suspect if enough people ask, they'd put it on their website. You'd, I can get every discharge monitoring report in the state off the IEPA website. I look at those fairly frequently. You can look at uh, most of the, I think a lot of the air reports are on the website. If, if the public asks for it, that's a pretty cheap thing for them to do. But again, a FOIA is not that hard to do. I, uh, you know, we do them about once a week. Okay, thanks. All right, um, Eric. So just just to be sure I understand, there's nothing in the consent degree that would prevent a citizens group such as WATCH from pursuing any action in the future. Is that correct? Well, any action that they otherwise had standing to pursue, uh, there'd be some right. question. Uh, and, but no, I think the yeah, short answer is. Yeah. The, the short answer is we can't sign a deal for WATCH. Wait, uh, no, uh, but uh, right. Uh, <laughs> but, but there's nothing in the deal that precludes either WATCH or members of WATCH from pursuing any action that they have legal standing to pursue. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just say something on the record. The, um, uh, if it weren't for the meeting on the 19th, I would be prepared to approve the consent decree now, but I do respect both the motivations and the, um, uh, you know, and, and also the fact that they really want full public consideration, so I would, also be willing to uh, hold off until the meeting of the 21st before we uh, before we take action. Charlie? Uh, I want to go back to the sole source aquifer and the, the code that you sent us says Illinois Administrative Code 811.302. How does this Illinois code refer back to the federal EPA regulations? Well, the, what the, the code section that you have before you, interestingly, has been on the books for years now, as far as I can tell. But interestingly, we never had a sole source aquifer until we were successful with the Muhammad Aquifer. So uh, this has always applied to any aquifer that's been officially designated by the US EPA as a sole source aquifer, and now we have actually succeeded in that effort. And so now this regulation clearly applies to the Muhammad Aquifer. So it's a state regulation that based, incorporates that based on a federal yes result. Okay, correct. Because, because I, I pulled up the federal sole source designation of what it does, and it says all proposed projects receiving federal funds are subject to review to ensure that they do not endanger the water source. Right. And it says basically uh, that that it's it's only if federal funds are being used right. then the feds step in right so uh, if no federal funds are involved then then it's this illinois regulation that really comes into play then correct 
Yeah. Right, federal, right. The federal protections are, are nice. I mean, but that we knew from the beginning that getting the federal sole source aquifer designation was, was not going to protect you from very much. And, and specifically, it was not going to stop this project. Okay. Dennis? And I, this is just for maybe a, a smaller thing, but so um, if we were to adopt this um, and the restrictions we're applying to the Clinton landfill, would the, would the Clinton landfill then be um, known as or listed as merely a municipal landfill? Are they still going to be saying that they have chemical waste um, potential? They're not going to be no. able to say that anymore. But what about hazardous waste? Are they going to no, be able to they would not be able to do that because they've never gotten either the state approval or local siting approval for a hazardous waste landfill. So, so they are now only can say that they are just a landfill. Just a municipal just solid a waste municipal landfill. Solid yeah, that's waste. the practical effect of the consent decree, absolutely. Okay, so they can no longer be a special depository for any other kind of thing. That's correct, and, they, and, that, and, the, and there's been some misstatements or misunderstanding about that, the suggestion that this, this one unit with these heightened protections somehow can accept waste that can't otherwise be accepted in the rest of the landfill, and that's not an accurate statement. Now they, now they have to put the same kind of waste they could put in the regular landfill in so that unit, even though it has these added protections. So they're just dumbed down to being just a regular old landfill now? Well, that's one way to put it, sure. Okay. <laughs> I, I, had a I, I do have a question, um, and that is, uh, what is the incentive for the company to have this settlement? What is the incentive for the company, the landfill company? Well, I think they, they think there were obstacles to getting uh, they, they think it's uncertain if they were to go back to the DeWitt County Board, certainly. Uh, they think now that there would be people that would offer technical evidence for the first time, really rebutting what, what uh, uh, you know, they would have put on uh, without any resistance. Uh, I'll tell you the truth. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, I frankly, I, I'm not going to say they're stupid, but they're giving you a very good deal. I think that they don't want to litigate anymore, and they'd like to make peace. Is really the just most get on with business. I think that they, I think that they've had it on this, and probably I haven't looked. My guess is is that the, is that the price that they can get for storing some of these waste has gone down in some way. The market's probably shifted, uh, and they probably would rather have peace than keep fighting. That's but I'm speculating too. And, uh, you know, I have a hard enough time knowing what I think without trying to tell them what to think. And okay, I don't know. You. Charlie? Well, I, I would speculate that uh, just disposing of regular garbage is profitable enough. So um, the, uh, the second question I had has to do with the potential that this company, um, company's owners, just spins off, creates another um, a limited liability corporation and and goes before the DeWitt County Board on another piece of property um, and uh, builds a, a landfill of whatever kind for any kind of waste. Well, we can't. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, we, we, you know, we, we well, the, there's the, nothing the, that the stops decree, these, these the decree people. runs with the land, so it will affect any future owners of this facility, but we don't have the ability. I mean, I mean, there's you're really other, getting there, beyond what we have yeah, the capacity right. to do in our lawsuit now. Sure, right, it'd yeah. be great okay, to so, say. And yeah, so where I'm going with yeah, this is yeah. that I would really like to see um, a plan of action that the consortium has going forward. You know, uh, and, and Fred Stevens uh, um, was very eloquent today when he, when he lobbied me on, on this issue and said, you know, we, 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 we've gotten through phase one with a great coalition of partners uh, at many levels of political support across party lines. And that's a, that's a very good point. And moving forward, what's phase two? I which think is these, these changes. And so yeah. I really would like to see a list of what those potential things are that we're going to go 
asking for and what the cost to the consortium is to continue as a consortium. You know, do we have interest in the 14 members right. uh, to keep moving forward uh, for further protections? Well, I think, uh, um, I know Steve Carter has come up with a very interesting list and that's been, yeah, yeah. And uh, I know Al Wehrman, our extremely capable technical consultant who basically got us the sole source aqua designation. He's got some interesting ideas about legislation to look at. And, uh, you know, if we're going to spend money to do this, we have to come up with a new intergovernmental agreement, and that gives me the heebie-jeebies, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, but that's what we would need to do. We don't have any authority now uh, to spend any money on it. My general sense is that all of the coalition members are on board of, yeah, we want to look at legislation, and I think we would have a, a very easy time, in my view, getting resolutions, for example, passed by each and every one of the members to support various bills that we could get introduced, and I think that would be really helpful. That's nothing, we've never been able to do that. We've never done that in the past. We've had local legislators, uh, and thank God for their efforts, suddenly introduce a bill, we find out about it later, then we kind of scramble and, and have some input on it. I think we need to be a lot more proactive on that. And I think uh, as a group, we need to say, this isn't just some isolated citizens who want this. This is 14 governments in central Illinois who want this. And I think we have a much greater chance of getting through the various committees and really getting the attention of the General Assembly. I, I would have to say that when the uh, the group of governments met that was the consensus that we this is just the first step and we're going to have a plan step by step of what kind of legislation needs to be passed and how we go about getting it done Eric so I did some quick looking up of the company so the parent company is Peoria Disposal and so they actually run they actually own two uh, waste disposal companies that do business in our town, Waste Management and Cleanway. Correct. So, and they are uh, actually all over the place. So they probably, so one perhaps reason for settling is that we actually regulate, uh, and among us, the various communities regulate lots of their uh, lots of their, you know, subunits. Diane? Well, as long as we're putting our list together, I think it's absolutely nuts that a county of like 16,000 people can set regulations and make decisions on a water supply of affecting 750,000 people. So I would add to the list a notification requirement any time yeah. um, landfills like this well, or we, in the future yeah, are being cited. I've put together considering. a number of proposals along those lines. Our, our, the optimal outcome is no new landfills over right. the Muhammad Aquifer. Then we don't have to worry about getting notice from some small county that doesn't have the resources to understand or fight it. Uh, but the fallback position is everybody who has a stake, whether that's every county, maybe every municipality, gets formal notice about any application for a new landfill facility over the Muhammad Aquifer. And I think that would be our fallback. That would not be as satisfactory, obviously, as a strict ban, uh, but that's something that uh, a number of us have put together a number of permutations and I think worth looking into as okay. well. My last question is, have you been invited, uh, looking, at, looking at this meeting on the 19th, have you been invited to speak at this meeting as a representative of the coalition? I'm concerned that this meeting is not going to present all sides of the issue. I'm not even sure what the meeting is. I also want to point out that it is on the same day as the Illinois Municipal League annual conference in Chicago, and a number of us won't be available to attend on the 19th. So I'm not sure what this meeting on the 19th would accomplish if it doesn't provide a factual presentation. We've heard a lot of assertions tonight and in previous nights that are basically m misunderstandings or misrepresentations and I concerned that that same sort of thing will happen on the 19th. So are there representatives from the, the coalition invited to this meeting? Well, 
I'm always invited to these things. I'm not formally, I mean, I, I don't have, uh, you know, a place on an agenda as, as far as I know. I'm a little torn about that. Uh, and I, I've been kind of in the middle of a lot of turmoil about this and a lot of strange claims being made one way or the other. Uh, uh, I'll probably be there and I'm doing, in, in, the, in the, what I'm doing to supplement that is I'm trying to get information out in writing to respond to some of the talking points that uh, I have to respectfully suggest are misleading and represent misunderstandings of what our lawsuit can accomplish and just as importantly what the current law is. Uh, those are kind of two po problems that I've seen again and again as far as, well, why don't you do this, why don't you do that? And the answer is, well, we don't have any power to do that or ability to do that. Uh, you know, that needs to be the focus of, of legislation. And no matter how many times I say that, quite frankly, uh, I'm, I'm hearing the same talking points. You'd like to think that at some point, I, I'm, but yeah, I, I'll probably be at that meeting. Well, the city of Champaign and the city of Urbana are co-sponsors, so we should ask that you be there. Aaron? I was going to say something along the same lines, hoping that someone, um, uh, either uh, Mr. Hooker or, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Albert Edinger. Mr. Edinger? Yes. Uh, would be there uh, just for a healthy and robust discussion. Okay. And maybe gotcha. to just clarify yeah. some particular points. Yes. I am not comfortable with the assertion that you guys have all the facts and watch and some other folks don't have any facts, right? You know, I'm not comfortable um, with that uh, premise being put forth that, you know, these folks don't know what they're talking about all of a sudden. Um, but I do see that there may be some differences or some um, clarity that you all may have had through these discussions or that uh, certainly I hear from a lot of the conversations and my initial conversation or, or concern was about what can be done and what's outside of the scope of the, the actual lawsuit. Right. And I appreciate what Charlie was putting forth about where do we go from here, right? right? Uh, is the consortium going to all of a sudden walk away and leave Watch and others on their own to go to clean up this, this mess. So I, I think that there's, it's, it's, it's a good thing for us to move forward with these discussions, to have them that, like we're having now. I'm going to motion that we defer this into our September 21st meeting after the 19th. Um, so that's the motion that I'm putting on the floor. Okay, there's a motion by Ammon, seconded by Smythe. Any discussion? Mr. Jacobson? Yeah. Oh, it's a, just a deferral? Okay, so we don't debate it? We don't debate it? Oh, okay. Okay. So there's no vote? Is, is a fate accompli? It's a fate accompli. Wow. And to what date We're is it deferred? 21st. The 21st. Okay. All right, so we will revisit this on the 21st. That is September 21st. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Manigan, would you like to continue at item D? Well, yeah, just for the record, uh, item C was, uh, was held over until the next uh, Committee of the Whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I cannot con continue with uh, D, E, or F. Uh, state law precludes me from participating, <laughs> therefore I shall recuse myself and ask one of my colleagues to take over the meeting. Okay. Okay. okay, Diane. Ordinance number 2015-08-092, which is an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 3, Section 3-43, increases the number of Class G2 liquor licenses for SOILL restaurant systems doing business as Dotties, 1901 South Philo Road. For the committee, I move approval. Second. Motion by Marlin, seconded by Ammons. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? Yes. Mr. Brown? No. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. That motion carries. That was a strong no, Bill. 
He's getting tougher. <laughs> All he counts for what? <laughs> ordinance number 2015-08-093, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 3, Section 3-43, increasing the numbers of Class G1 liquor licenses for A-plus entertainment, doing business as A-plus VIP lounge, 214 West Main Street. For the committee, I move approval. Second. Motion by Marlin, seconded by Ammons. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. That motion carries. Ordinance number 2015-08-094, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 3, Section 3-43, increasing the number of Class A liquor licenses for Upscale Entertainment Group, LLC, doing business as Flight Ultra Lounge, 142 Lincoln Square, Suite 138. For the committee, I move approval. Second. Motion by Marlin, seconded by Smythe. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. That motion carries. Mr. Madigan, thank you. All right, agenda item G, ordinance number 2015-08-095, an ordinance authorizing the sale of certain real estate, 1306 and one half West Dublin Street. Uh, the committee uh, uh, recommended approval of uh, the ordinance and on behalf of the committee I so move. Second. second. Motion by Madigan, seconded by Smythe. Any discussion? Mr. Ammons. Can we combine all three of these? Oh, if they all no, it's more out. trouble than it's worth. Okay. Any other discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons. Yes. Mr. Brown. Yes. Mr. Jacobson. Yes. Mr. Madigan. Yes. Ms. Marlin. Yes. Mr. Roberts. Yes. Mr. Smythe. Yes. Mayor Pressing. Yes, that motion carries. Uh, the committee uh, recommended approval of ordinance number 2015-08-096, an ordinance authorizing the sale of certain real estate, 5 Hill Street Court, and on behalf of the committee, I so move. Second. Motion by Madigan, seconded by Smythe. Any discussion? Mr. Brown. I just have a, a procedural question. I thought we had a public hearing on this last time, and then we had another one this week. Was there some... Was I think it was just this week, but just I could this be wrong. Week. Okay. Is that correct? I thought, I thought for some reason we thought we didn't need one for this one, maybe. Okay, but we had one just to be safe. And okay. okay. Just checking. Thanks. Yeah, the other one was our property. All right. Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Madigan? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Mayor Pressing? Yes. That motion carries. Uh, agenda item I, uh, the committee uh, moved to recommend approval of ordinance number 2015-08-097, an ordinance authorizing the sale of certain real estate, 1310 West Hill Street. On behalf of the committee, I so move. Second. Motion by Madigan, seconded by Smythe. Any discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Madigan? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? Yes. Mr. Smythe? Yes. Mayor Pressing? Yes. That motion carries. Thank you. We'll move on to reports of special committees. Mr. Roberts? Yeah, I'm saying that the... Uh, I'm just re really um, re-announcing the fact that the Urbana Sister Cities Committee and, its, and the Sister City Program here is going to be hosting a delegation from Chonville, France. They're going to arrive tomorrow evening here in town, and they're going to be with us for several days. Um, we're going to be touring uh, the school districts, visiting departments in the city building, um, taking them on tour of the university, uh, and generally through the... Um, the uh, uh, downtown and areas within the Urbana. Uh, one of the places that the city uh, is um, making available a general uh, time to meet and uh, and discover who these people are is a uh, an event that's going to be at the Urbana Free Library on Friday, September 11th. 
between 2 and 3 o'clock, and we, you may have seen a poster in the downtown or a poster at the library. It invites anybody who's interested in meeting the French delegation to come and visit with them during that hour of time at the library. Um, light refreshments will be available, and it's a great time to uh, discover the uh, interest that can occur when you talk to somebody from another uh, country or culture and discover that they're just as fun as you are. <laughs> What was the time again? <laughs> what time? It, it's uh, it's Friday, um, this September 11th, coming up in the public library on the first floor, um, McFarland Hood Reading Room, and it's between 2 and 3 in the afternoon. And I would like to report on the visit from our Chinese sister city. Um, we took them to King's School and got a wonderful tour from the principal. And they were so impressed and so delighted by that school that it was, it was really wonderful to see. They were very surprised that children got to go to the school without having to pay tuition. Um, I explained later about property taxes, but <laughs> they thought we have, well, we do have free education for children when they go to the school, but there's, we have to pay for it ultimately. They really enjoyed going to Meadowbrook Park and um, we really had a very happy group of Chinese visitors, so that was a lot of fun. Okay, uh, Bill, you want to say something? Um, yeah, I'd just uh, I imagine most people have heard, but uh, Mary Ellen Farrell, um, member of our library board, passed away last week um, after her struggle with brain ca cancer. She was a member of the board for more than 20 years, serving as president for quite a few of those years. She's also a familiar face in the community. Um, after her retirement at the U of I, she was seen at the food co-op often, and I'm sure a lot of people know her and, and appreciate her, uh, her, her attitude and her contribution to life in Urbana, and she'll be so <coughs> sorely missed, but um, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we appreciate her service. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll move on. Reports of officers. Libby Tyler, Community Development. I'd like to introduce some folks to council tonight. Um, introducing two new members of our Economic Development Division. And on the right is Miles Thomas. You've met Miles before. He's been working with us for uh, over years, an uh, intern as an economic uh, develop or community and economic development associate. Now he's an economic development specialist. So welcome to Miles. And next to Miles is Libby Horowitz. We felt we just needed another Libby in the department, and we needed another Elizabeth in the city. So uh, we searched far and wide, and we <laughs> found Libby in Philadelphia. And she's relocated here from Philadelphia and uh, has a background working for other economic development agencies and also served in the Peace Corps. And um, so I'd like to welcome Libby Horwitz and Miles Thomas, both economic development specialists for the city. So that council goals, those long lists of goals, a lot of them have to do with TIF districts and economic development and running programs like Enterprise Zone. Uh, these are the folks who will be helping with that. And I know that um, tonight, Miles has our, um, month, our monthly ED report to present. I am happy to report lots of development and new businesses opening. Um, I'm just going to touch on a few items from the ED report just to keep this a little short. Um, I did want you all to know that uh, Main Street Plaza, also known as 123 West Main Street, is getting two new tenants. One will be replacing Error Records, who is the former multiple leaseholder. Um, so it's C-U, S-E-E-Y-O-U, CD and vinyl will be replacing Air Records with a wider genre selection. And um, they will also be um, adding Champagne Urbana Adventures in Time and Space, which is a uh, tech venture where friends and small teams use observation and critical thinking to solve a series of puzzles. Um, sounds like it's going to be a pretty cool little space in there. 
Um, other Main Street items, facade construction is complete at Air Urbana, and I'm sure you all have seen the uh, shipping containers that have been delivered. Um, Can I ask a question on that one? Sure. Yeah. Um, who, uh, who ultimately approved the facade? Uh, the, I believe the facade was approved by Building Safety, but they're still in discussions about the, um, the completing the project before they open. So it didn't go to any public review process or anything like that? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, Libby, do you have any other? No, that's correct. We don't have extra design reviews. A lot of our buildings are reviewed administratively. You just see special things like tonight with the see you at home rezoning special use permits. As you know, design review covers three small areas in Urbana along Green Street and Elm Street, uh, along Lincoln and Busey, and parts of historic East Urbana. So there's no, there's no way of um, communicating with the developer um, concerning or even reviewing the design before it's approved by the administrator? No, the designs need to meet code. It's That's a very long, arduous process sometimes that they need to be reviewed and they need to meet code. That's correct. And zoning and all of our other development reviews. We have uh, development review happens on a daily basis and it's a multi-departmental process. So uh, it's um, certainly not something that is taken lightly. Bill? Just to follow up on that, I think in our TIF agreement we specified a minimum amount that they were required to spend on the facade. Do you know if they met that amount? <coughs> yes, we did investigate, yeah. but I don't have uh, numbers right handy. Yeah, we just but as Miles mentioned, we are um, still finaling up that project. Yeah, so. as, as the project progresses, they've been approving the, the various expenditures um, to receive payment on the agreement. So we're going through those as, as they are performed to make sure that the minimum is, is met. So that development agreement will dictate how those chunks are delivered. Uh, is there any other questions on the Arab side? Sure. On that same project, um, the the gravel inside d does that have to be ADA compliant? And if so, is it? I believe that is the the question that's been posed to Building Safety right now, um, and they'll be discussing that and finding what is most suitable for ADA compliance. Dennis. And on the same project concerning the gravel. Um, if that's a place that food is being served, um, what are the uh, health regulations concerning the floor and cleaning it and uh, overseeing a healthy safety um, environment? All of that is defined by the CU Health District, but um, as we've been told in, in, the, in the plans for the space, um, there will be no glass or breakable materials that will be um, utilized in the space. What about organic but food dropping into the cracks and how, what's the situation of that dirt accumulating? Other than CU Health standards, I, I'm not sure what the uh, procedure is for their, their timeliness and so taking care of organic waste. Yeah, it's, they are working through public health for the food handling. It's like a seasonal use just like sweet corn festival or a food truck rally. So it's not like a restaurant. Um, but we do have building safety review on the um, interior of the space. And I think you know these are good comments on the accessibility and the outline. We are waiting for the site plan for the layout to make sure that it's accessible. But it is a, an open air seasonal type of use. So it's a little bit different than um, a lot bit different from a restaurant. Any other questions for Airbound? Okay. Um, the other work that's been going on in Main Street, um, you all just read about A plus VIP lounge. Um, work is nearing completion. They've actually had a final ex inspection on the karaoke lounge upstairs. Um, and work is also nearing completion on he heel to toes expansion into their space at 108 and a half West Main Street. Um, Philo Road, we just had a new business opening. Uh, studio Vita has a 24 hour fitness studio um, that's card access, 
and um, it, they very quickly moved into that space and it's a nice addition to that block. Um, we have for Urbana Public Arts, two new artworks have been installed. These are the images you see on your screen here. Uh, this first image is Arl's Morning by Phil Strong um, and was installed at the uh, UBA just a few days ago and we held a reception with the uh, artist who's pictured here. And um, Nathan Westerman's slat paintings were installed at the Urbana Civic Center and we also had uh, a, um, a opening event with the artist Nathan Westerman uh, who is pictured here. Uh, let's see. For other ED and marketing news, um, CD staff, Economic Development Division staff, um, assisted the Urbana Fire Department distributing welcoming materials at the UIUC dorm move-in day. And we recently held our, what we thought was going to be the final food truck rally. Um, all of the food truck vendors that came to our previous food truck rally um, expressed interest in continuing. Um, they, they felt that they uh, received an equal amount of uh, um, sales as their previous, um, as the previous uh, food truck rallies. Uh, so we've also extended that to the last Tuesday in September and October. Um, I missed my note here on the Art Expo, but uh, September 13th, this coming Sunday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., we'll be uh, featuring 23 local artists at our uh, Art Expo at the Civic Center. And let's see. City staff attended the uh, unveiling of U of I Willard Airport's new branding campaign which is prominently featuring both Champagne and Urbana in their marketing materials. And they're slowly making their way towards opening their new website, iflycu.com. City staff in the, e well, ED division staff held the uh, third of our four annual um, development luncheons. This focused on green building in Urbana and Champaign. We had Sue Dawson from Hendrick House, which you see pictured here. This is the uh, rooftop garden uh, that they use for their facility. They recently achieved LEED Gold certification and um, this and the other projects. Um, Scott Baer, his passive house on Washington Street in Urbana, and Scott Tess's um, Energy Star certification uh, guidelines. Um, were all covered heavily by Smile Politely and we were featured in an article recently on Smile Politely's website for our developers luncheon. And finally, the UBA had a lot to say about the 40th annual Urbana Sweet Corn Festival. This year we had the uh, Psychedelic Furs, the Church, and Berlin. Uh, we had a little bit of poor weather on Saturday, but most of the event was very nice. Um, we had nearly 80 different vendors in the various spaces throughout uh, downtown. And this year we actually ran out of 20,000 ears of corn slightly earlier than expected. Um, so there was, uh, every corn buck was used. <laughs> um, pending any other questions, that's all I have for you tonight. Eric. So maybe I'll say something as the uh, council representative to the Public Arts Commission. Sure. Uh, the, uh, so um, there's a terrific website for the Art Expo, urbanaartexpo.com. That's correct. Thank you. Which is just fabulous. I mean, there are reproductions of some of the works. There's background web pages on each of the artists. And it's really a terrific job. But the other thing that I'd like to mention is that we have you know, we, we're getting reports from the grants we made last year. And one of the really interesting things is that a couple of the projects involve performances in, in the mall, in, in Lincoln Center, Lincoln Square Mall. <coughs> and uh, actually, the Dr. G's brain shop was uh, collaborating in, in getting those set up and so forth. And they were very, very successful, but they did something really interesting, which is they 
you know, attracted people who were, uh, you know, who were there. And one of the ideas that came out of today's meeting of the Public Arts Commission uh, is that um, maybe we ought to think seriously about trying to get some continual or very frequent arts presence in the mall as a way of attracting people to the mall. So I think that you're going to get some uh, something from our, uh, you'll, you'll get some, some contact uh, from our uh, uh, from our arts staff person. And we're, we're aware that there are some issues with it because the, of the management of the mall, but, but, but hopefully, that, hopefully they could come to see that this is really in their interest. And so uh, I'm kind of, so I think things are, you know, I think, I think that uh, maybe we can combine arts with economic development. On that note, um, Dr. G's Bram works, um, there's a small note about them expanding in the ED report, but um, after their recent uh, opening of a new store in Decatur, Illinois, they have come back to refocus on their main store in Lincoln Square. They took on another space at Lincoln Square next where the former beauty salon was located. And they are doing an innovation lab for tutoring um, young children and um, engaging them with the arts, puzzles, and performing arts. So we have a great uh, tenant there that is uh, readily expanding. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other uh, reports of officers? OK. Uh, let's move on to new business. The first is ordinance number 2015-09-098, an ordinance approving a major variance to allow a garage that will encroach 13 feet 6 inches until the re into the required front yard in the R3 single family and two family residential district at 701 East Elm Street. Yes. Hi. Greetings. Kevin. So I will. Uh, I'll try and keep this as brief as I can while hitting all the uh, all the points that need to be hit. Um, so this is a request to construct a garage that may encroach up to 13 feet six inches uh, into the required 19 foot front yard at 701 East Elm Street. Um, this property is on the southeast corner of Elm Street and Anderson Street, um, and being a corner lot, the zoning uh, ordinance. Um, says that it has two uh, front yards. So it has one on Elm Street and one on Anderson Street. Um, the applicant would like to build a garage and a breezeway behind her house on the west side of the lot, uh, which would encroach into the required front yard um, along Anderson Street. Um, and would it would extend an, an additional 12 feet beyond the edge of the house. Um, and the breezeway would be directly in line with the house. Um, the applicant would like to maintain the usable space behind her house and to allow for convenient access to the house, especially during winter months, and that's why she's requesting this variance. Um, there are also four city-owned trees in the public right-of-way to the west of the property. Um, the northern two trees are well-established black walnuts of high value. Um, and the proposed garage would be built, or sorry, the approach to the uh, garage would be built between those two um, walnut trees. Um, the excavation for the driveway and the garage footing uh, might damage the root systems of the trees, which would then reduce the health of the trees. Um, and due to the potential for damage, the CD arborist recommends that the applicant pay a fee to the city uh, in advance of construction for, for that potential damage. Uh, on August 19th, the Zoning Board of Appeals heard the case and voted 7 to 0 to forward the case uh, to City Council with a recommendation for approval. Um, so really the, the two uh, main issues uh, with respect to this case are first the variance itself, um, and then second uh, are the possible impacts on the two city trees. Um, so first, with respect to the variance, um, the applicant has provided a very thorough description of uh, different potential site plans that she considered prior to, to making a request for a variance. 
um, and she considered and rejected um, several site plans that would conform to the zoning ordinance, um, but really to meet her goals uh, of preserving the views uh, of the backyard from the house and building the garage close, um, close enough to provide convenient access. Um, she feels that her current proposal is the only one that would, that would work. Um, and given the narrowness of the lot and the requirement uh, for a 19-foot front yard setback, um, it doesn't appear that other site plans would uh, meet the applicant's desires. Um, if you look at the surrounding neighborhood, um, there are at least uh, 24 out of 47 uh, corner lots, so over 50% of other corner lots zoned R3 in the neighborhood that appear to have buildings that encroach into the required front yard setback. Um, and five of those appear to have garages that encroach into the, into the front yard setback. Um, so we don't feel that the uh, request would be out of character for the neighborhood. Um, with respect to the impact on the city trees, um, the applicant has scaled back her original plans and, and she has been really active uh, working with city staff, um, CD staff and, and our city arborist um, to address our concerns. Um, the city arborist has estimated that 30% uh, of each tree's root systems could be affected um, by, the, by the driveway and the uh, garage footing and in order to mitigate the damage suggests that the applicant uh, compensate the city for 30% of the value of, of the trees uh, which comes out to $3,417 uh, which the applicant has agreed to pay. Um, we feel that the, applica that the application uh, meets uh, the five variance criteria as outlined in your memo starting on page four and five. Um, if you're interested, I can explain any of those uh, in greater detail. Um, so with respect to this case, uh, the city council can approve the variance request. You can approve the variance request with ter certain terms and conditions, or you can deny the variance request. As I mentioned, the Zoning Board of Appeals voted uh, 7 to 0 to recommend approval for the variance uh, with two conditions. Uh, those are on page 6 of your memo, and those are that the site plan is developed in general compliance with the attached site plan uh, entitled proposed site plan, and that the applicant agrees to compensate the city uh, $3,417 for the effects of the construction of the driveway and garage on the health of adjacent city trees, and the applicant agrees to submit payment prior to issuance of any permits for construction of either the driveway or garage. Um, staff concurs with the ZBA recommendation. That concludes my report. I can answer questions. Um, I know the applicant is here uh, to answer any questions that you may have as well. Thank you. Dennis. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, I think um, my, I do have like a, a little bit of interest in this. It's in my neighborhood. And uh, actually, I, dr I run past this house a lot in the morning. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, when this came up, I, I had sign, I'd seen the sign that there was going to be um, a variance request, and it was about a garage, and I didn't really track it. Uh, I didn't track it through the planning commission. I'm, I got lots to do, and I just didn't track this particular case. And, um, but I looked at it more carefully in the last two days, and um, I've just got a couple things to offer. Um, first of all, uh, I don't have a problem uh, with the garage being built uh, near the lot line of this house and having a breezeway connected. That's not, it's not anything that would be an unusual thing to see in the community. Um, I was sort of amazed and very interested in, in how, um, how much the arborist valued the walnut trees. And there's also the, the situation where this house is really on a pretty kind of a high rise in the, com in the um, area. It's up on a hill, and there's about a three-foot at least grade from the street level to the sidewalk. So, um, so I had a couple of thoughts, and actually, I want to give this piece of paper to the applicant. So I've already given her. Oh, you did. Yeah, I, I gave her a copy. Yeah, very good. All right. So, um, 
So uh, one of the problems is that we're going to destroy, uh, by, pla by placing the drive entrance where it's proposed, and I've, there actually are little red flags on the embankment where this would be, um, we're going to be cutting down. I, I guess we're going to have to be grading down to allow the slope for the driveway to, I don't know, um, enter the, enter the um, yard in such a way that it's not a, you know, a, 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 I don't know how abrupt the climb is going to be. If the, if the grade for the driveway has to meet the lip of the sidewalk as it exists if, and then level out into the yard, is that correct? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not a, a driveway expert. Okay, so. so I guess what I was wondering is one of the trees is behind the sidewalk, but apparently not on the property line. Is that correct? Correct. The northernmost tree. All right. right. So that's the tree that's really going to suffer because it's going to have to be excavated down to get the driveway and the footings of the garage in. So I looked at the situation, and the tree immediately south of the second walnut tree, which we're trying to save two trees here, and when you cut 30% of somebody's roots, you're basically going to kill two trees. And we've seen this on Main Street where they, they built the straw bale house and they disrupted the root system of a pine tree that was going, been growing there for 100 years. And over three years, that tree died. And, and, they, you know, and it wasn't that close to the construction site. So I'm going to estimate that probably within three years, these two walnut trees will be dead. So meanwhile, the third tree down is a tree that's a, it's an oak tree, and it's already suffering. And you can see I included on, in the images here um, uh, brand, uh, leaf damage or bareness. It looks like basically that there's die off on the tree. If there's going to be a tree to be considered for removal, that's the tree to take down. That tree is already is stressed and on the way out. And if you remove that tree, that would provide you with a very clear pathway to put a driveway into the yard just a little bit south of where the proposed area is, maybe 12 feet south, we would save two trees. And if the, dry, if the garage was uh, opening and the garage was facing south, the, the cars could easily enter the garage. And so I'm just offering that this is a possible solution that maybe wasn't provided or, or discussed during the um, plan commission meeting, but might actually solve a lot of issues for the three and a half thousand dollars that the the property owner would save by not having to pay a fee to the city for the potential death of trees. I bet you could probably lay an extra twenty feet of um, pavement to enter the garage at a different angle. And I'm just offering this as a solution, which I would rather prefer to see than to uh, approve the the plan as shown. Charlie? Well, I was hoping to get the petitioner up here to uh, join the discussion here um, and get her reaction to this idea. And along with it, a couple of questions I want to throw out there is, uh, you know, if, if, if this is a scenario that we can work with, um, uh, would the city take down the oak tree for free? And that would be a, a question for public works. I mean, is it, is it a tree that Mike Brunk thinks is going to die anyway? or? Or, um, I, I think he likes to take down trees that have that show uh, d stress and it's disease. It's a red oak, or yeah, so it's some kind of oak. So that that would be something we'd need to find out. You know, if it's, it's a tree on the way out. If it's a tree on the way out, we would take it down anyway for f probably for free. So you would save that money, and then uh, I would I would imagine you'd want to run this by your architects or whatever as well and think about it. And and we can hold this for committee. Uh, uh, but you know, in general, I have no problem with this with this project moving forward, I think, as Dennis said, but here's an alternative that might save you money. So um, I'll address um, both, both, of those, um, both of those issues. Um, so in initial discussions, when I initially went out there with Mike, um, he did say that the, the two southernmost trees, so that oak and then there's another one further south, um, he said he wouldn't have any problem with those being removed at no cost. Um, but we did um, discuss that with the applicant, um, and I think she could probably explain better why um, why that solution wouldn't work. Um, it was a consideration um, that that didn't make it into into uh, the application. So, actually, first of all. Um, I have to strongly disagree with the notion that within three years those trees will be dead. And the reason for that is because 
uh, Mike Brunk came out and we spent about an hour at the property looking at all the options and discussing uh, the realities of the trees and uh, those trees have been there quite some time as he pointed out I have roots going well over into most of my neighbors at this point and so when he came up with the 30 percent and the value that he's asking me to pay to the city it was based on his interpretation uh, and I have to defer to the city arborist as being the expert on this that with the potential for root damage taking into account the grading and all of that with the potential they it might damage up to 30 percent of the roots and he would expect some dieback from the trees he definitely did not anticipate that the trees are going to be dead and have to be removed in fact what we talked about at one point is the one that is the larger and what appears to be the more valuable well it certainly is the more valuable <laughs> when you just look at the dollars is the one on the north the problem with that one is that it also is the one that's extending over my house so when that branch comes down and walnuts tend to drop branches just because of weight um, so there's one already that hangs down quite a bit in the yard and one that's over the house so we had discussed at one point between the two trees if we have to sacrifice one which one would be the one to sacrifice the one on the north would be the one to sacrifice the one to the south isn't as attractive but we think it's stunted because of the much larger one on the north but the other thing he pointed out because he had considered something very similar to this which would be because my goal is to also maintain as much of my backyard and with this and trust me I love the idea about not having to pay the fee because of the walnut trees but at the same time with this because of coming in a few things occur to me I'm going to end up paving a great deal of my backyard that I wouldn't have paved right now so that would be landscaped area the other thing is when I'm coming and going from my garage I would have to make a 90 degree turn to go in and also to back out my backyard is fenced and if I'm going to have it fenced then I'm gonna to have to run a fence along that driveway as well so I'm going to end up adding another barrier to myself when I'm trying to back out but the big thing is what he had considered was if I came in somewhere towards the back there and to try to maintain the yard initially and he told me as I'm just trying to throw out any ideas here he talked about doing a lengthwise garage and then we both quickly realized that's not going to work well because then I have to park the cars in this way but the bigger issue is one of the things that he's looking at in terms of the risk to those two walnuts is the amount of pavement so with this proposal if you look at the second page that this dot right here is the south walnut and that's the one that we think long term uh, we would want to protect the most and so you have a street on the west side and then we would be running a driveway on the south side driveway and garage on the east side so at that point we would be cutting off most of its root system um, because you end up going around it and his concern is not just the depth for the grade but also the amount of surface that gets covered with pavement so we're dramatically increasing the amount of pavement by doing that versus just the straight shot so that was sort of the main reasons against that would be adding actually not adding taking away a lot more of my backyard to have a, a driveway that's paralleling uh, what is now the property line of the fence but also I really think that proposal even though it's down a little bit still puts it between uh, that where the oak tree is because there's also a light post there so I'm rather landlocked between this walnut uh, and that light post so to go between there it's still going to be close enough to that one uh, walnut tree that I'm a, from this it looks like we're almost ringing that tree much more so than a straight shot between the two I want to ask you about the walnut trees I did get a complaint from one Urbana resident that she has a walnut tree that's brought a lot of squirrels so do you have a huge quantity of squirrels I put out bird are they for my chewing squirrels. up your house yeah, I've got yes <laughs> in fact um, I've got a front porch that's wood that is just shredded so at some point that's got to be replaced I have routinely six to eight squirrels in my front yard they're fun to watch they tear up a lot of things they also bury walnuts everywhere so they dig everything up and leave walnuts behind. so you'll have more walnut trees so because they're very <laughs> it's those two walnut trees and I'll tell you I've, I, I love the fact that these trees are so old and I appreciate the history and, and the value that they add 
Um, but it's a real love-hate relationship because they are one of the messiest, <laughs> most disgusting trees on the planet. They really are. Track that stuff in all the time and stuff. So yeah, it's uh, they're messy trees. But these trees are very old. The other thing is that uh, Mike Brunk also is not sure. He tried to look at the base of the trees, and the sidewalk for the one to the south is actually that tree has grown significantly since the sidewalk went in. So it's actually kind of bulging over the edge of the sidewalk. But what he can't tell at this point is how deep down the roots go. So one of the advantages, because the trees are, and you were talking about how it is a hill like that, and so one of the advantages is with the trees being on the lower part, the roots are going to tend to go down more. So we're really not sure until we do that excavation how much is going to be damaged. And he said if the soil is a, a more of a loose loam, those roots may be very deep and we may not damage that much. And it's, it's amazing soil that I've got there. So I'm optimistic that that's going to be the case. Okay. Any other questions? No, well, there's others. Um, Bill Brown and then Charlie. Um, yeah, so the existing driveway would still be used for parking your extra car, is that right? Yeah, I, right now I've downsized the garage and I'm hoping that I can have it wide enough that I might be able to scrunch two cars very closely in there. I only use it one at one time, but if not, then that other side would just have a car parked there. Okay, and do we have any rules against having two access points to a single fa or yeah to a single family house? No. Okay, and um, I mean my main concern really would be that it would encourage somebody to park over the sidewalk because if your garage door isn't open, you might be tempted just to park there and run in and get something, and then and then you know be on your way or whatever, and that um, you can get ticketed for that so. Um, <laughs> that's that's the that's the remedy, I guess. But um, people sometimes don't appreciate the fact that there are occasionally blind people in the neighborhood that are used to being able to use the sidewalk without um, without obstructions. So that can really be a major hazard for something like that. So just um, wanted to mention that 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 would be a main concern. Um, I think that was my only question. Okay, thanks. Okay, Charlie. Yes. Uh, I was asking about the gravel drive, so I'm, I, I was hoping it would go away. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'm a little puzzled. Uh, you wouldn't uh, flare out the driveway a little bit so that you could pull two cars in and out? Because if you flared the, I assume you'd flare the driveway. Yeah, it's really a matter of my original plan that when I talked to a couple of different garage builders, they were, of course, everyone's going, oh, you got to go 24 by 24. That's a lot of my backyard. And the mm. thing is, if I would have it the 24 feet wide, then it ends up going past that other walnut tree a little bit more. And I knew that would jeopardize more of the roots. So I downscaled it back. Mm. Um, but yeah, my hope would be that when we get up to the top, that it can flare out a little bit so that I can maybe get the two vehicles jockeyed in there. They're not really big vehicles, but. Um, I, I don't know for sure, but that was one of the concessions I was willing to make to try to minimize the damage to the walnuts. I guess I would encourage you to get rid of the gravel driveway if you find you can park two cars there. Yeah, and if so, I would love to get rid of the gravel driveway. Okay, Dennis? So, um, so is the gravel driveway that's on the side of the house acceptable as a parking area for a residential unit? Yeah, that's correct. Um, if it existed before 1990, September something, 1990, um, we allow those to be maintained. Okay, so in other words, it's not an option to put a permeable pavement uh, driveway in and that therefore allow water to soak through and water the roots of the second um, walnut tree? That would be an option. Um, it, it's not something that we require mm -hmm. for uh, in our zoning ordinance it would certainly be an option though and uh, so when the uh, when the uh, drive reaches the edge of the city sidewalk then um, uh, doesn't matter how steep the drive is as long as it reaches the street right again I'm, I'm not an expert on driveways so I'm not sure what what an acceptable grade would be. And uh, so the city arborist was willing to uh, cut down a healthy and mature walnut tree, but not a, uh, uh, a diseased oak tree, and that was his recommendation. No, his, he was willing to um, accept some level of potential damage uh, in exchange for compensation. Mm -hmm. 
for and the walnut trees. And again, I'm 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 pointing out uh, this the, the the pine tree that was on in front of the uh, house on Main Street at <laughs> 605, and it was a healthy tree until the house was built, and the house was built about 20 feet behind the tree, and within three years, yes, the top started dying away, and the tree's removed today. It doesn't even exist today. So I don't think that just we're not. I think that we're talking about serious damage to a tree that could be avoided by just a little bit of extra thought. Okay, we have an ordinance. Um, is there a motion? I move uh, passage of the ordinance. Second. Motion by Jacobson, seconded by Marlin. Any other discussion? Would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Ammon? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Jacobson? Yes. Mr. Madigan? Yes. Ms. Marlin? Yes. Mr. Roberts? No. Mr. Smythe? Yes. That motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay, now we have appointments to boards and commissions. Civilian Police Review Board, I'm recommending Grace Mitchell. Um, Property Maintenance Code of, Board of, Code Board of Appeals, Keith Erickson. MOR Development Review Board, Jonah Weisskopf. And reappointments to boards and commissions. We have had two fantastic people representing us on UC2B, Charlie Smythe and Pete Resnick. <laughs> Upheld. <laughs> I move approval of all of the above. Uh, that's a correction here first, please. Um, the, the dates are backwards for me and Pete. They should be, and, the, uh, and, and, and Pete, it's 2018 for me and 2017 for Pete, not 2108. Uh, he does not intend to serve till 2108. Oh, well, it actually on the ordinance it says 2018. Yeah, well, I should be 2018 and, and Pete should be 2017. Sorry. Okay, we'll take your word for it. Okay, so um, we have a motion by Marlin, and who, who did the second? I just heard objections uh, okay. from I'll, I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Marlon, seconded by Eric, by Eric Jacobson, with the correction on the dates for UC2B. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. And there being no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>